the Escape Goat podcast. A podcast series featuring the discussion of many different topics, flaws and all, based on personal whims and fascinations. Hosted by me, David Fagiani, and several different guests. On this is uh, John your friend who is an author. Is that is that correct? Um, you've you've authored some stuff, John. Uh, well, define define author. Uh, <laughs> I've I've <laughs> I've published some poems. I think is probably the the uh, the neatest way to describe that. And is that how we, is that how you guys met? Were you a fan, David, or was it? Or did you work together at? Uh... He was a massive fan. It was really, really <laughs> weird. He just I, I did a I did a poetry reading in town once, and I just remember this guy bounding up to me and going, "Oh my god, you are you are without question the, the best human poet. being, the just the best human being I've I've ever actually come across." It was actually like oh, uh, you wouldn't know it. Can I be he your so friend? Coy. Yeah, he's so coy now, isn't he? It was actually like yeah. King of Comedy. Me and Sandra Bernard kidnapped him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My um, my my friend Simon, who is a massive Scorsese nerd as well as me, one of the the best stories he told me about King of Comedy is the scene where where uh, Jerry Lewis is walking down the street and he refuses to sign an autograph for a woman who's standing there, and she goes, "You should get cancer." <laughs> <laughs> as, he, uh, as he walks off, and apparently that that was a real thing. Jerry Jerry Lewis was like, "Can we use this? Because this has actually happened to me walking down the street, just having a little old lady scream at me because <laughs> he wouldn't sign an autograph." Yeah. Oh, that doesn't surprise me. You imagine some of the abuse like celebrities get when they don't, uh, you know, bow to people's wishes. Mm. This is another. This is one for a subsequent podcast. But I was, um, I think I've said this to you before, Matt. But I reckon I think King of, King of Comedy is like really, really influential on like, I, I guess what you might call like cringe comedy of like, uh, basically The Office is what I'm thinking of really. But, uh, and extras, oh, obviously. But. Awesomely, the, the the scene where the, the one that gets me the most is when he's in the office and he's I think he's he like to, speaking to the secretary, and he goes, um, uh, and he goes, yeah, yeah, that's great. Excuse me, do you speak for Jerry? Do you speak for Jerry? <laughs> You know, that moment where it's just like, you know, it, I just thought that that was, you know, De Niro doing it. I think that's what's amazing. It still surprises me every time I see it that it's De Niro being so funny and so kind of um, animated as well, you know, because he's, yeah. he's sort of the king of cool and the king of like, you know, quiet sort of, um, you know, roles. But like, you know, seeing him in King of Comedy is just like, it's just crazy because even in his more violent roles, like in Goodfellas and in Taxi Driver, he's still pretty kind of stoic, you know, but he's he just... You know, uh, yeah, he's, he's just brilliant in that film. He's so so funny and so like animated. It's uh, it's just like a different person. Yeah, like, you know, and yeah. It's somehow it's somehow as terrifying as Taxi Driver in a slightly different way. I, I feel like. Yeah, definitely. You know, what did what did everyone very quickly? Obviously, what did everyone make of uh, Joker? Because obviously that is that it just owes so much to King of Comedy. It's basically De Niro mm. doing the Jerry Lewis part. Put put it put it this way, John. Like a friend of mine uh, said, I'm going to see Joker tonight, and I said, "Have you seen King of Comedy?" And he said, "No." And I said, "Good," because <laughs> you, you will think that this is the best movie ever made. In that case, and um, it was yeah. remarkable cast, casting De Niro, wasn't it? Like that really was like that was about as over yeah. as it could get, you know. Yeah, I really liked it, despite it being owing, you know, seventy five percent of its material to to King of Comedy. But yeah, no, it's. Uh, uh, I think it, they probably thought enough people haven't seen King of Comedy that we can get away with this. Uh, but no, I thought it was. Uh, I still thought it was a good, good film. Oh yeah, yeah. Enough, enough people who are going to go and see a kind of gritty supervillain origin story possibly won't be familiar with King of Comedy. But enough of the audience will go and see it and and feel really pleased with themselves. Yeah, for, exactly. For knowing that they noticed it. Exactly. There was a great bit of Joker that I didn't notice for myself, but someone pointed out on, on a podcast a month or two afterwards, and it was the bit where, you know, where he goes to the uh, the Wayne Manor and, like, yeah. lonely Bruce Wayne is playing on that sort of ridiculous, like, playground, like, little yeah. adventure playground that's all for him. 
someone was pointing out that I think he calls him over and and to get to him Bruce Wayne slides down the pole like you know like uh, like Adam uh, West yeah, <laughs> very good it's like, that's where he got the bat pole from. I had not noticed that <laughs> which I thought was a, a nice touch if, if, if intended one of, one of my favourite scenes was the the scene in the bathroom at the opera you know where he confronts uh, Thomas Wayne mm. because uh, obviously the whole thing of Thomas Wayne being a bit of a dick which I thought was great, you know, sort of like a Trumpian like figure, Trump like figure. But um, yeah, I, I I really liked it. I, I just thought it was so cold hearted and so mean spirited, which is like I could sort of feel the cinema that I went to. Like everyone was just kind of like you know slowly kind of sinking in the chairs and just becoming more depressed and like is it actually going to go this way? And I thought you know there's not there's not going to be a happy ending here. And um, also I loved the you know the sort of the ambiguousness of the ending. I thought it was. Uh, you know, really, really cool. Was it all a dream? From the very beginning, they kind of put that thought in your head that maybe nothing in this film is actually happening, which I thought, which I really like. So, uh, yeah, yeah, big fan. Mm. I thought it had trouble ending. It was there's a couple of um, false summits. You know, it's one of those like um, movies that has. You can tell they came up with like about four ideas for a cool ending and then used all of them, <laughs> one after the other, <laughs> rather than yeah, sticking totally. one. Um, but that's a minor complaint. Anyway, uh, let's get on to the subject matter. Um... Imagine a situation comedy set in the year 1485. It all started out that way seven years ago for Black Adder. Now, Black Adder I've had described to me as a wicked, witty, and rude character that stars in a British TV show. Uh, Black Adder is actually shown in the States as well. We've seen him several different times, and the star of that show is actor and comedian Rowan Atkinson, who is here with me this morning. I think you've had probably a lot of fun with this show. Mm -hmm. For those who haven't had a chance to see it, we'll show them right now a scene from the show. I think this is actually Black Adder's wedding day. Take a look at this. Look, I'm waiting for my father-in-law. Last thing I want is some scruffy old beggar blocking the corridor or something of cabbage. I am your father-in-law. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, how much do you want to clear off? Edmund, how could you? He's my father, my only living relative. Ten pounds should do the trick. Ah! All right, there we go. Edmund, you mustn't. Oh, don't worry, I'll get Baldrick to beat him up after the ceremony. We'll get the money back. Here we go. I saw this show described somewhere as a situation tragedy. I love the expression. Mm -hmm. Would you want to explain that? Well, I don't know. It's just because it's because it's so unlike most situation comedies. I mean, the idea of it is it's supposed to be funny, obviously, but, but at the same time, it's historical, and, and the original inspiration for the first series was Shakespeare. Although, since then, every we've done four series, and every series is set in a different century. So we started off in Shakespearean times, kind of 1500s-ish, but, but... Could it come in, all the way forward? In yeah, no, in the last series that we did at the end of last year, which I don't think has been shown in the States yet, but it will be soon, was set in the First World War in 1916. So eventually, Blackadder will uh, get up to the 1990s. Yeah, then. absolutely. Yeah, the idea is that everyone dies at the end of every series, and then you start again with their descendants a hundred years later. Which is kind of the way it is here yeah, in your exactly. country. Yeah, exactly. However, I've been told that it has an American influence. Yeah, I mean, I think it is, it's, it's bound to appeal, I feel, to Americans more than most British situation comedies, certainly, because the hero is quite cool, because generally English um, comic characters are quite downtrodden and rather stupid yeah, kind of losers, and, and so look silly and, and are losers <laughs> whereas you know you would never describe Eddie Murphy or, or Steve Martin necessarily as you know unattractive or downtrodden they tend to be rather cool guys yeah we are our, our, our much, hero always has to be a yeah, hero your comic heroes are cool whereas our comic heroes tend to be very uncool whereas the whereas the black adder uh, the part that I play that uh, that he is he is cool he's a cool guy <laughs> hello Welcome to the Scapegoat Podcast. Welcome back to the Scapegoat Podcast. This is uh, the first episode of Series 2 and Episode 37 overall for those keeping score or indeed just looking at the show notes where the episode number will be listed. Um, this is basically the end of uh, a sort of, you know, I sort of rested the show over the summer, this summer 2021, if you're listening in the future, <laughs> unlikely as that is. Um, having a bit of a rest and had to think about what we're going to cover in this uh, second series and uh, I'm pretty hyped for it. And for this first one, I'd like to welcome back two guests who've been on the show before. Uh, but they've been on separately, and this is the first time they've, well, met and, and been on the show together. So uh, I'd like to first welcome back my brother, Matt. How are you? Hello, I'm all good, thanks. And uh, I'd like to welcome back also John. How are you, John? Hello, I'm fine. I'm very well, thank you. Just, uh, to be honest, my, my level of expectation of humanity has been so dramatically and systematically reduced over the last 
let's say five years, it's just like, yeah, oh, a war, a war hasn't worked. We've left, we've left a bit of the world in a worse state than that it previously was in. Sure. <laughs> So I, I I cease to be bummed out. That's the good thing about that. I'm yeah. no longer bummed out about these things because my expectations are you're are completely numb to it now. Very low, <laughs> very low indeed. <laughs> Novocaine for the soul, as they say. <laughs> um, so I'd like to welcome you both back, and uh, we've, the reason we've got you back is kind of a follow up episode in a way, uh, and, and actually it's probably in in its own small way for this podcast the, an example of giving the public what they want because I was looking at the analytics for the first series of, of the Escape Grip podcast and checking out what were the more popular episodes and the more niche ones and, you know, the kind of ones that didn't do so many downloads and ones that did more. And um, one of the more popular episodes, and, and actually quite consistently since we brought it out, I, I guess like last summer, so it's over, over a year ago now, um, one that was getting sort of steady downloads every every month without me doing much promotion for it or anything like that, was the one that me and Matt did last summer on The Black Adder, the, the first series of, of Black Adder, the, the, the UK sitcom. And that was one, as you probably remember, Matt, that was one that I was, I sort of started the show, you know, with just a bunch of topics that I wanted to talk about and had some initially that I was going to try and get done. And that was actually going to be one of the launch episodes. That was going to be the, one of the very first ones we did. And then it ended up happening, you know, a few months later for various reasons. But it was also one of the ones I wanted to cover because it was that, as we talked about at the time and, and on the episode, it's episode 15, if anyone wants to look it up. Um, the Black Adder is such a flawed, interesting, odd, not quite functional first series or, or you know just series as it was then you know of, of Blackadder that it it's it bears a lot of discussing I think and it's fascinating and it's really odd and sort of perturbing and and, and strangely structured and all that kind of stuff so it it made for a really good chat and I think it, I think probably that day you you said like you know well we'll have to do Blackadder 2 you know like or the yeah, series 2 yeah. and, and and I had some other people suggest that you know sort of after the episode and everything and I was always kind of as, as I think I said to you at the time I was like is it actually going to work to do Blackadder 2 yeah. because you know for reasons we'll get into yeah, yeah, Blackadder yeah. 2 is, is good <laughs> like, I'm not going to say straightforwardly good well I, I yeah. have I, on uh, uh, my podcast Matt and Mike Paul Focus uh, I, I always feel like I don't want to pick things that I absolutely adore sometimes because you know who wants to hear someone just gushing for an hour and a half about it you know it's that kind of thing where Blackadder the, the original series is kind of better, a better topic because there is a lot to criticise in it as well as it being brilliant in its own way so yeah i can understand your sort of trepidations about it however i'm, I'm looking forward to gushing over the next two hours about yeah. it i'd say now that we're now that we're here i'm glad we did this <laughs> yeah yeah no no totally i mean I, and actually you know having we've already watched it for, for the for the show for that is the second series of blackadder so it i think there is actually quite a lot to say about it and, and maybe some odder stuff as well you know baked into it um but I should, partly because me and matt on that previous episode, we talked a little bit about our sort of um, background and sort of shared, shared family background with with Blackadder and how we came to it and, and that kind of stuff. I thought I'd get more of your perspective on that, John, because I just wanted to kind of know, I, I guess, like what your first memories of, of watching Blackadder were and how that came about. Um, this was a really interesting thing to think about, actually, because I feel like Blackadder has always been with me, particularly Blackadder too. I actually, I, I can't pinpoint, I can't identify the the point at which I first saw it, at which I, I first came across Blackadder 2 specifically. I just know that at some point I had those massive double VHS box sets, basically, where you'd get three episodes on one tape. So mm. so a six-episode series would... Just mm. four six-episode series would take up an entire shelf. They were absolutely massive. Uh, so I just remember them just kind of existing being in my life i must have come across it um at some point for the first time i think maybe before that i think maybe i was familiar with is in 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 the mid 80s i guess or mid to late 80s when i was becoming kind of more aware of comedy and stuff it's when kind of hysteria and the secret policeman's ball and all of those things were were getting really really big so actually people like uh rowan atkinson and stephen fry and hugh laurie were all we're all becoming quite big establishment names. And I think I kind of maybe worked backwards a little bit from there and then discovered, you know, a bit of Fry and Laurie and um, and Blackadder and the young ones and things like that. So I think I kind of went back a little bit. Um, I should should say as well, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I will age myself by, by saying that I do actually remember Blackadder's 
Blackadder Goes Forth airing. I remember actually watching that. Oh, uh, wow. As, <laughs> as, as it went to air, and that was... Uh, oh, I did look this up. When is it? It's, it's like early 90s, isn't it? It's, it's, it's maybe... like 80... 88, 89, isn't it? Yeah, somewhere around there. Oh, God, is it? I think it's 88, 88, actually. I remember that because of the uh, Roman numerals at the end. You know, the, uh, the, yes. the end shot. Yeah, of yeah, course. Yeah. So, yeah, I remember uh, I remember watching that, you know, when it was, was being broadcast. So that, that ages me. But the, the, the first three, I don't really remember coming across them first. But obviously, you very, as you've already talked about, you very quickly established that something about Blackadder the first wasn't quite right and didn't quite work and that's largely because you already knew two and three certainly very well um and again i don't really know how it came about but i think for years i didn't even really know uh black out of the third very well i think i just knew two i had just watched two over and over and over and over again so it's it's mm. It's like died in. Do you remember, like, you know, preferring um, season two to season one, or do you remember sort of thinking these two are quite drastically different? Because we've been focusing a lot on, uh, and I, I remember as a kid thinking, I don't really like the first series. It's not as funny to me. It's more disturbing, <laughs> and sort of, you know, in the sort of realm of black comedy. Did you remember having that differentiation yourself and thinking that? I like one more than the other or like, you know, did you have a favourite? Yeah, I think, uh, I think it was always a conversation that, you know, you'd, you'd have with your friends when you all were getting to the same stage of watching stuff where it would be a, you know, a, a fun conversation to have about, you know, which, which series of Blackadder is your favourite. And that's, that's a way of, a way of mm. bonding. And like I say, for years, three didn't really rate for me because I don't think I watched it very much. Um, and the first one, you know, you, you watch it once or twice and you, you kind of already realise that it's not the same beast as the other three series. It's not as funny. It's, you know, it doesn't have the gags. The characters aren't as well drawn. It's not as quotable. It's, you know, it's it, that's something you want. Or <laughs> we all wanted from, from broadcast TV at one point was to be able to quote it to each other. Mm. Well, that's also also like been fascinating to me is like you know these meetings between season one and two. Did they sit down and say we want to do more Blackadder? They said no, and then they went no no no, but but it's going to be different. You know what I mean? Like, or did they just say all right sure, and then they read it and they went oh this is different. You know it's like you know did they did they think they sold it on the well, fact it, they were going to change the entire structure of it? Well, I think quite a lot of that's come to light since, hasn't it? In you know, in a sort of plethora of interviews and mm. documentaries and special features and things like that. And I, I think, I think it sort of seems to have been a bit, you know, conscious course correction and decisions, but also, and also at the same time, budgetary reduction, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's actually, it's actually quite similar. It's actually very similar now. I can think of it to um, the way the Star Trek movies uh, happened. You know, the, the way where you get Star Trek the motion picture, which is big and huge and beautiful but quite inert and unappealing and and not very good at entertaining really in the conventional sense and then and then they you get wrath of khan which is partly a deliberate reaction to that but it's also to do with the budget being cut by about you know, yeah <laughs> into like a quarter basically or something you know so it's kind of and then so then you end up you know not not certainly with this thing that's largely a kind of bottle show that you know is that you know as, as has been well documented is kind of like a submarine battle in space and all that kind of stuff you know so it's good but but it's phenomenally entertaining and well acted and stuff you know so it's kind of it's kind of a weird parallel to blackadder isn't it because um a lot of the improvements or you know i think mostly improvements are, or overwhelmingly improvements in, in series two are to do with performance choices that i'm sure we'll talk about a lot um you know but also to do with that budgetary reduction and refocusing can i can i just say for anyone who's playing along at home um i made that first reference to star trek at about the 16 minute 30 mark so if anyone had 16 minute 30 uh in the uh, in the scapegoat <laughs> podcast suite is, is that quite late oh no for for yeah. That's quite for, a late for David, one. I would say, uh, I'd say that's about average. I mean, I haven't done the stats on them yet. We don't know what's, <laughs> what season two is going to bring, but uh, yeah, it was. Well, I, well I, I, I wanted to say, yeah, a lot of this has, has come to light, and they have talked a lot about this. Like, basically, the, the short version of the story is that after the first series, Michael Grade, who was the head of the BBC at the time, basically said, it's not funny enough. It didn't get the the ratings. It's way too expensive. 
So Richard Curtis and Rowan Atkinson went off and Rowan Atkinson decided that he didn't want to write it, that he he wasn't enjoying the writing process or he was it would be stronger if he was just a performer. So they brought Ben Elton in. So they completely rewrote a script. And I, I can't remember, I think they they said it may even have been Ben Elton's idea where it was like, this needs to be in front of an audience. The, the, the performers need to be, they're live comedians. They need to be able to play off the laughs. They need to be able to play off an audience. And also, let's not film it on film stock in you know Northumbria (laughs) with a cast of hundreds it was just way too expensive so he was on the verge he'd already cancelled it and I think the story is that Richard Curtis goes running after him and goes no 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 look here's a script they're 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 funnier they're better and they're a lot cheaper because they're all going to be filmed in a studio uh, and it basically saved it and it basically reversed the decision and they said okay Mm. All right, you can go and make you can go and make Blackadder two as long as it's cheap and in a studio. Um, but I also wanted to say, and I, I'm not sure if I've dreamt this or made the, this up, but Michael Grade, so who cancelled but then recommissioned Blackadder, wasn't he also the man who gave us Roland Rat when he was at uh, was, <laughs> at, was at ITV? Didn't he give us Good Morning Britain and Roland Rat? Certainly period, so, period appropriate. Like, yeah. There's. There's the Look, duo yeah. right there. The two things we have Michael Gray. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I wish Roland Rad stuck around a bit longer than Good Morning Britain. Uh, I had I, one of my one of the one of the earliest artifacts of my childhood is a Roland Rat tricycle. That's, uh, <laughs> no that's way. Like, that's the first the first and today only vehicle I've ever owned. I, I don't remember that. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> controversy. <laughs> uh, can I? Exactly. How did it manifest? Because a tricycle, you've not got. Not got much surface area to brand on that, have you? There's not an awful lot you can put. Uh, the wheels were solid plastic. Oh, okay. And they had Roland Rat's face and his chums all over. And his chum. Over. And uh, how many? How many of which can you name? Oh, I don't know. I mean, uh, was it? Um, I, I'm probably going to end up naming the supporting cast of Itchy and Scratchy uh, instead. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's Kevin the Gerbil. Kevin, his best mate was a was a. Rummy gerbil called Kevin. I was always uh, more of a Gordon the Gopher fan myself. Yeah, it was either or, wasn't it? It's was, it was the uh, Stones and Beatles of our day. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 80s, 80s culture. I'd like to apologize, by the way, this episode may contain 80s culture. Uh, <laughs> which is now 40 bloody years ago. Which is oh, God, don't even. Don't even. I mean, this is. I mean, I didn't even introduce it as the sort of time scale because because the, the first series of Black Adder we discussed were aired in 1983, and this this series aired in 1986. So there, were, there was about three years, you know, from from the first series ending to this actually airing. And uh, I think we've talked about this before, Matt, haven't we? You know, it, which will be relevant to some of the aesthetics we talk about and some of the actors even. But the the chronology of that in terms of early 80s or early to mid 80s comedy is the first series of The Young Ones happens in I think 81, and then the first series of Black Adder happens in 83. And then uh, the second series of the Young Ones happens, I think eighty four, and then th- and then this. So that's that's the, that's the pattern is that they sort of leapfrog each other. Wow! Um, they, so, they didn't know they were born. Yeah, that's a good run. It's a good run, isn't it? Um, it, it it's it's interesting because um, you know, obviously, we'll, we'll, when we talk about the, the the episodes more specifically, uh, Rip Mail obviously crops up in the first broadcast one here. Um, but it, it's kind of. It also made me look up things like the dates of Fry and Laurie because you mentioned Fry and Laurie before, John. Um, you know, because Stephen Fry is, is in I think every episode of this, and and Hugh Laurie crops up in two of them. And this was pre Fry and La- I think the Fry and Laurie pilot I looked at us up yesterday like was aired in eighty seven or was made in eighty seven, and then it took a while to get to proper series. You know, a couple of years after that. So it's kind of. But I think they were already working together, weren't they, and doing doing things in sketch shows and all. And they are in the second series of the Young Ones. Uh, together in the University Challenge episode as well. Yeah, I mean it. It all comes from the Footlights crew, though, doesn't it? It's so before, before even you know Fry and Laurie, before any of it. It's you know they'd all met at Cambridge. They'd all done Footlights together, and and they all knew each other. Whether they were in the same year or not, I think they there, there was one you know big year, wasn't there? When they when they took their Footlights show to to Edinburgh, and it was Fry and Laurie and. Uh, Tony Slattery and Emma Thompson, <laughs> weirdly. <laughs> so um, Emma Thompson then, you know, obviously does not go down the same comedy route as they do. But, you know, they're, they're all part of the same clique. They're all part of the same 
gang to begin with. It was kind of the, um, what was the college called in the young ones, you know, it was Emma Thompson and Stephen Fry and Hugh Laurie were in the back of the car, weren't they? Uh, what was the college called, was it? Um, oh, man. Oh, we all know they're question. scumbags. Scumbags. And, yeah. and, oh my gosh, what was it called? Is, is, it, is, it, is it like... Oh man, this is going to be tempting to look up at the end if we if none of us because come Neil up with says it. we're going to be playing. Uh, we'll edit um, we'll edit this out so one of us will just go. Oh yeah, <laughs> we're going to be playing such and such. It's going to be really heavy and tough. That's what Neil says, isn't he? Yeah. Oh yeah, man, I think it is. It is. It is like Oxbridge or something as well. They they, they make up a sort of something college uh, Oxbridge, isn't it? Yeah, something. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's not Footlights College, is it? Because I, I feel like that's too it on the is. Nose, no, it? it is. It's Footlights it is. College. It's Footlights College, Oxbridge. Yeah, it's yeah. Footlights College. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's a sort of showbiz joke, apart from everything else. Like, um, rah rah rah! We're going to smash the oaks. Well, the bit. To, 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 yeah. Oh my god. I mean, the bit to flash forward uh, in in Blackadder chronology is um, that that joke in the fourth series when they, you know, when Blackadder um, ferrets out the spy by pretending that Hull is one of um, England's great universities. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but I didn't, I didn't, which I, I thought was funny at the time, but but I didn't realise that, that, you know, um, the line that Melchit gets, that Fry gets as Melchit, where he's like, yeah, that's right, Oxford's a complete dump. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's, a, that's a Cambridge guy saying that to Rowan Atkinson, who's an Oxford guy. And, and uh, Rowan says, well, quite. <laughs> that's, his, that's his retort, <laughs> isn't it? Which is wonderful. <laughs> I, I can't, uh, just to get self-indulgent for a minute, I mean, I cannot overstate how how influential this was on my sense of humour, you know, Blackadder in general, but uh, especially the second series. I mean, I, when I think about it, not only do I still quote it daily, you know, without even realising it, but throughout primary school, and you know, especially primary school, I remember it was basically every joke I made was essentially a Blackadder rip-off joke of some kind, you know, with my friends and my school chums. Not all that everyone got, you know, and stuff. And a mixture of that and Monty Python albums was basically that was like the formative stuff so you know I really it is that thing of like if I met any comedian and I had to thank them for literally building my sense of humour it would probably be Rowan Atkinson you know I'd have to say just you know it, it, it's just you know so incredibly formative and the, the idea of that man in the middle the world weary man in the middle is there's nothing funnier to me than that well, world world weary, but always sort of pointedly caustic, right? You know, yeah. that kind of thing where he's, you know, he's, it's not, it's not that he's looking to, kind of, you know, like in the first series, he's always looking to become king. Essentially, yeah. this guy doesn't really seem to have any ambitions as such beyond just, you know, money and comfort, yeah, and comfort stuff, you know, really, but, yeah, surviving. But also, also, he's he he is your your classic everyman figure, because we mm. can all identify with that. We could all watch that and go. You know what? If I if I had the right opportunities, then I'd be I'd be rich, or I'd be famous, or I'd be better than I am. But idiots keep getting in my way, and yeah, that's why yeah. that's why I haven't got as far in life because of idiots. I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. It's their fault. That I'm, I'm better not, than yeah. this. I'm better yeah. than this, but it's it's because I'm a victim. It's be, because I'm an idiot, and that's a you know that's a perfect every man. It's it's we, mm. we all kind of feel like you know we we could be better than we are if only we'd had we'd had the right opportunity and less idiots had got in our way. That's that's so true, and the, the, there is a line in season three where he says, "Is it uh, toffs at the top, plebs in the bottom, and me in the middle making a fat pile of cash out of both of them?" <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, that that's sums up his. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's right. He, you know, he wears that his heart on his sleeve in that scene. Well, it's also kind of you know um, in that in in the coverage of the first season, Matt, where I talked about how in the years since watching them as as a kid, I, I'd watched I Claudius. Oh, and, yeah. you know, realising that the first series was at least partly consciously, I think. I, I mean, if only by the casting of Brian Blessed, but there's other things here. It is kind of like, in some ways, a sitcom version of I, Claudius. And, you know, the kind of the idea of a, a simpering, quite cowardly person at court who's trying to avoid being killed, essentially, by, by tyrants and, and maniacs and stuff. But actually, this, in some ways, the second series is actually a, a more, a, a better distillation of that. In, in the way that, you know, um, he interacts with Miranda Richardson's queen, for example. You know, we'll talk loads more about her in a bit. But, you know, that that, that works. And, and obviously, the I also only realised when I first watched I, Claudius, that the, the, the opening credits of Black Adder 2 are, are, a take, are a parody of, of the opening credits of I, Claudius. There you, you go. Know, so the direct the snake link. slithering across the, the board. You know, it's, that is exactly how I, Claudius starts. Oh, gosh, yes. Well, I remember, you know, reading the scripts for the first time and them reading like a delightfully sort of, you know, cosy 
feel to them instead of instead of the extreme scale and ambition of the first series, which was you know you know worthy. I think in its way it was a it, it was a worthy thing to have done and experimented with. But but there was always this feeling. Well, you always hoped it was going to be funny, rather than you believed it was going to be funny. It was, it was, which was a bit nerve-wracking for everyone, you know, not least the, uh, the actors. I think part of the difficulty was that trying to be funny wasn't really what we were about in the first series. We, we were awfully arrogant, really. Yeah, but. yeah, and it was the usual, absolutely, you know, pretentious, you know, bluster, you know, formed quite a large part of it, I think. No, it is hugely ironic that having set about to make the first series of the Black Adder as unlike Forty Towers as we could, by the time we got to the second series and had completely rejigged it in the way that it was, we did end up with three sets, you know, and something quite claustrophobic and uh, and and hierarchical. Um, so in many ways, we sort of learned the lesson of our ways and actually our our, our outright rejection of the traditional sitcom form, you know, was not. You there know, are good good reasons for it, aren't there? I mean, why yeah, there are good reasons why sitcoms tend to have the shape that they do. It was it was just a joy, you know, you know to have real people in the room and 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 to be recording it like a theatre show. Really, you know, we did you know rehearse it all week and then we put on a show for two hours. Admittedly, only you know half an hour of uh, of program came out the other end of it, but it, it but it felt like it felt like what it was. Uh, a live performance. In season one and two, there is always the direct threat of death. You know, so that the stakes are really, really high. In like, especially in season one and two. I mean, in season four as well, uh, of course. But you know, having mm -hmm. uh, Queenie as as this, you know, I mean, she could literally lop his head off at any point. You know, so the, the stakes are pretty high in these things, you know, and so there is such a desperation yeah, to to his uh, to his you know, at it, to his um, deeds. There's a darkness to most of the episodes, aren't there? You know, I, I think in in most episodes, literally execution is the thing that might happen if yeah. the plot resolves. In it's it's way, mentioned in every going. episode, pretty much, isn't it? Yeah, I think the only one where the Queen's not, you know, actively threatening him with death is, is probably um, Money, where the Bishop of Bath and Wells is, is threatening him with murder as well. So it's kind <laughs> of, with uh, worse than death. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, uh, no, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, let, let's let's talk a bit about Rowan Atkinson in general in this, because um, I think, you know, you talk about getting some of your sense of humour, like central parts of your sense of humour and sort of um, attitude from it. Matt. Yeah. I mean, I was I was re-watching this over the last couple, couple of weeks, and I, I, some of the episodes I watched more than once, and... One thing I did, um, I actually watched um, Head and Potato today. Yeah. And I, I, I basically, I think, I think it was during um, Potato, I basically realized that I was just watching Rowan Atkinson. You know, like whatever, ever, yeah. everyone else I was basically treating as an audio play. And I was just watching Rowan Atkinson react to things. Yeah. <laughs> and it was really, it was really interesting. It was really, you know, I was sort of studying more closely than I had before in sort of, you know, not, you know not a technical way exactly because I don't know enough about acting but you know just kind of just kind of really watching all the all the, all the choices he made and things like that mm. and it, I think you, you just because he changes so radically from the first series to this in his performance style doesn't he and in, in owning I guess I guess he dominates the screen in the first one and it's such an extraordinary performance in the first series whether or not it's a successful one it is extraordinary but I think this one is obviously subtler but but nonetheless remarkable I mean John have you got have you got thoughts on on that yeah, I'm, again, I'm going to half remember something I've read, uh, which is, um, again, either it was probably more likely to be Ben Elton, I think, when they were writing the second series. Um, one of them said, like, don't overwrite it, like, give them give them mm. time, we'll be in a studio, they can go right in close, and just let Rowan do his thing. <laughs> just don't don't overwrite him. Just let him react and just let him do his thing, and you'll get free free laughs. Basically, you'll get the joke, and then you'll get Rowan's reaction to it, and you'll get free laughs. And that's it's exactly what you're talking about because a lot of the the best stuff uh, in Blackadder, the writing's obviously incredible, mm. but you know, it's small things. It's the small looks. It's you know, it's the way he says Bob. That it's they're 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 jokes that aren't actually written to be jokes, and they're they're sold by Rowan Atkinson's performance. John, I think to be to take you up on on what you've just said, I I think that the funniest moment, the funniest line, which isn't even a line, 
is um, where uh, Miranda Richardson's character... Oh, wait, no, this is in three. Is that okay? <laughs> I'll jump to three anyway. But just, just in terms of what you were talking about, in terms of reaction, um, in terms of his actual reaction, uh, his, you know, acting is reacting thing is um, when Miranda Richardson's character, you know, when she's the highway woman man, she says, you know, she's acting like a child and she says, I think my nose is so wee that the pixies gave it to me. And then it cuts to Rowan Atkinson's face and he doesn't say anything. And for me, that is the funniest moment in season three <laughs> and it's his reaction and he says nothing and it's just his face. And, and you know, I think that is, he's just got funny bones, hasn't he? He's just one of these people who, you know, he, he, he just, he, he, could, he, he would walk on stage or walk into the studio and you would just laugh because he's just funny, isn't he? Yeah, in my rewatch today, you know, I said I was watching Potato. Uh, we'll talk about that episode later. But the uh, the bit where um, Melchit and him enter the throne room together, and Melchit's being ridiculously obsequious by pretending that the Queen's joke is funny mm-hmm. and, and pretending that he was fooled by it and all that kind of stuff. Oh and, and yeah, that, kind of yeah. Just, that, that, that was that was something where my watching of Rowan Atkinson paid dividends because I was just staring at him with, like <laughs> like looking with utter disdain at Melchit for the entire thing, and then he just does the you utter creep. <laughs> 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 <Yeah>. <laughs> There's um there's uh, so th- I think this actually maybe did occur to me on the rewatch. Um, there's coming back to the everyman thread here that one of the, one of the things Rowan Atkinson does the most, or one of the things they write the most for Rowan Atkinson to do, that's not a gag, but he turns into a running gag, is when something happens, when something goes wrong, when Baldrick does something stupid, when things don't go to plan, he just does that. Oh God! <laughs> or of course, <laughs> yeah. and he does that all the way through it, and that's that's the character. That's the everyman character. He's constantly being buffeted by by the wheel of fortune, and he's he's always getting screwed over. And we see that probably every episode, I guess, if I went back mm-hmm. and counted. It's quite a debonair exasperation, isn't it? It's quite uh, it's quite cool. You know, it's quite cool in yeah a way. He, he's not losing his rag he's not getting really angry he's he's not he's not genuinely hurt by the letdown he's going of course this is how things always pan out of co- just when i thought things were going to go my way of course well he has absolutely no moral compass he has no belief system he has no you know he doesn't like you know the bit where he talks about you know i'm i'm edmund blackadder and i'm the new man in charge of religious genocide and the way he says that with religious genocide yeah yeah, and the way he says that with with you know as if it's like the most mundane and boring job (laughs) in the world or or this is this is molly an inexpensive prostitute yeah an expensive prostitute Uh, it's that it's that sort of disdain for people but like telling the truth at the same time isn't it yeah you know just just describing things without ornamentation the, the, one of my favourite jokes. Again, it's in season three. Is uh, I recant my Catholicism. I recant my Catholicism. That's it. Like, never occurred to him to say because that 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 is genius, isn't it? Like you know, just showing that he just has absolutely no moral compass whatsoever, and that's how you know who you're dealing with then. And you know that all he yeah. wants is a comfortable life. That's all he wants, really. It's why it's why I, it, we're going to get more and more into tempted into just talking about funny bits, aren't we? I can see, but it's it's why the weird um, in in heads the very first scene, you know, with the um, with him being kind of weirdly paternalistic to Baldrick and trying to teach him how to add. Yeah, is 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 is, is kind of it's almost like slightly out of character, isn't it? But it's also it, it's the exasperation underpins it, you know, because I was thinking, you know, obviously, obviously, there's a lot of funny lines in that scene, but the, you know, the bit the bit when he's like. He's almost like pleading with Baldrick to think for himself. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of like it's, I think it is so important. You know, it's just like it's kind of you do get this sense of exhaustion, you know, but also like he is actually genuinely trying to improve him. You know? Well, it's a last ditch effort, isn't it? He's thinking, I'll try one more time, and if he doesn't get it, he's a complete dead loss. And yeah, <laughs> that's the basic. Because the only, I, th- I suppose, partly because the only alternative is the has to speak to Percy. But... The, yeah, yeah, exactly. We're talking about a rock and a hard place, but the the line um, yes and no. Is one of the is well, again. <laughs> oh, is it? yes. I mean, quotable. Yeah, Jesus Christ. I mean, like, I. No, my question, uh, John, actually, is like, you know, you were saying that you, you didn't have any particular uh, love for, for season three early on. Are you, do you have a favourite season now? Oh, we're going there already, are we? Um, it, it, <laughs> probably for that very reason that I, I. I guess I didn't binge as much on season three when I was a kid. I think I really binged on season two 
Um, and I think I probably binged on season four. Do you know what? If maybe only for the simple fact that those are like two periods of history that I actually studied at school. I think it was because I had more background knowledge about the Elizabethan age and about the First World War that actually allowed me to connect. Whereas I don't, I still don't really know a great deal about the Georgians. Mm. Um, I I never really studied them and have have never really caught up with them. So I think that's why I didn't binge so much on on season three. But I think the answer to that that question now is for that very reason because it was less died mm. in to my DNA. I think when I eventually came so back maybe to it still it. surprises you a little bit yeah. in the lines like you yeah know, still maybe take you by surprise but also bit. i just think you know i have a deep and abiding love for for hugh laurie and i just think you know the prince regent character is queenie's queenie's fantastic obviously queenie's perfect but in a in a yeah. in a different way as a different dynamic you know talking about doing you know nothing and making people laugh when when Hugh Laurie does the chicken impression after saying, you know, lucky, lucky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, I, that was in the front it's, of my mind when you were saying that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, Hugh Laurie just is, they're all on on top of their game again. So I think now I would probably say if I had to, if I could only watch one of them, for the rest of my life, maybe I would choose three. I have a really vivid memory of re- uh, of rewinding over and over again and playing back in slow motion the bit where he kicks the cat. <laughs> you know, and I know that I know that sounds that sounds very morbid, but it was just the you know to sort of see the wires and see how it was done. But you know, because it was so funny and like well timed and bizarre. And then I remember, yeah, sitting with my, my dad and probably with you, David, with the remote control and doing that VHS slow motion. You know, those really shitty, like, crackly frames. And <laughs> like slow motion just being like, oh, yeah. yeah, there's a string and it pulls the cat, like, off into the distance. And, yeah, yeah anyway, yeah. that's a really big, nice I'm memory. Glad, I'm glad you mentioned Dad, actually, because on, on my rewatch just today, I remembered one of our dad's favourite lines, which was is in head when, you know, he's meeting the and speaking to the, the ploppies, no relation. Oh, yes. And... Uh, <laughs> And, and 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 Mistress Poppy says that thing about you know it being like a you know a family atmosphere, and 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 Mister Poppy just t- t- like sort of turns and whispers like kind of like Mistress Poppy's a bit of a social realist. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I remember, I remember Dad just thought that was a really really funny. You know, and again, that's it's a, it's a subtle joke, isn't it? That we we probably wouldn't have liked as much, but Dad, yeah, Dad loved. well, yeah, that's it. And the genocide line, I think he really really liked that one as well. And uh, <laughs> my father, Daddy Ploppy. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. <laughs> was known as Ploppy the Slopper. <laughs> it was from him that I inherited my interesting skin diseases. <laughs> They're fantastic as one-offs, aren't they? Uh, oh, yeah, so I really enjoy that. Man. I mean, like before we, before because we, we will get more into the episodes, but like um, the other sort of leads in this, because you've got Tim McInerney doing um, doing something more akin to what he does in series one, but I get, I, I guess, giving a, a bit more chance for him to breathe and. You know, you've got the off commented thing where Tony Robinson is is doing a well, a, a, a stupid Baldrick. Although it's not quite as I, I, I do. I do think that one of my problems with the fourth series is I do think that the stupid Baldrick becomes too too much. You know, like it, it just he becomes almost like kind of comatose as a character. You know, it's kind of like you know I think that that's just a bit. I think Tony Robinson just goes a bit overboard with it. To be honest, whether it was his choice or he was directed to, but like it's kind of. I never thought about this until now, but I think you're actually kind of right because there is some moments in season two where he says, you know, well, it's obvious, isn't it? You'll have to get murdered. You know, it's just like kind of like he is actually not completely stupid. You know, he does kind yeah. of have a basic understanding of Blackadder's affairs and, you know, his, his, his uh, yeah, how much money he's got and things like that, you know. So, yeah, yeah that's very true, I actually. This is, I, think in the, I think in this it's more that he's unquestioningly humble in a way, isn't it? It's like he's, I mean, loyal, but also just kind of, he, the kind of joke of the character is less that he's stupid. It's more that he just will never, ever, ever try to disobey Blackadder or do anything other than what he says. You know? Yeah. It's yeah. kind of, you know, it, it, it's kind of just, he's, he's just the perennial class victim i suppose really you know, yeah. um, there's even there's a line in potato when is it like uh, black is getting exasperated by um people celebrating so what raleigh and everything he's like what about the people who do the real work and Baldrick's just like what the servants he's like no no me people like me like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. So one, of the, one of the sort of uh, openly satirical moments in it you know? just just to throw in a, a season a completely off topic season three quote there is there is the one moment in all four series where where Baldrick actually talks back, and it's in season three, 
when Blackadder leaves and and he thinks he's left the kitchen and, and Baldrick says, You oh, big nose yeah. bastard. And Blackadder <laughs> just comes yeah, yeah. sweeping back in because he'd heard him. And that's the point. Yeah. That, like that's a genuinely really interesting textual point, isn't it? Is you suddenly see this inner life of Baldrick where actually the mask slips and he's like, I really do hate this prick. I really, I, yeah, I yeah, yeah, hate yeah. this guy. <laughs> and that's the the one and only time I think you see it slip in that way. Well, there's also the uh, the sort of hints in the fourth series, Baldrick, that he's either uh, a communist, a Bolshevik <laughs> and or pacifist, you know, if given the chance. But obviously, you know, it's, it's just utterly shut down every time he voices Baldrick, him. Baldrick, yes, sir. Go and clean out the latrines. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Right away, sir. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. So I, I was actually surprised that, you know, because... Um, uh, because they always orbit Blackadder, or almost almost orbit Blackadder, I suppose, except for when he's um, away in the in the jail in, in chains at the, at the end. You know, um, the, Tim McInerney and Tony Robinson. I think do they only get one scene together, just them, and it's the one where Percy's trying to hide in the box. Uh, yeah, in, in, yeah, <laughs> which is great. Um, That's a really kind of strange standalone sort of sort of slapstick scene, isn't it? Like, but then. What happens, or far, well, more of a farcical scene, but then it ends, it completely, Baldrick completely diffuses it, doesn't he? <laughs> Which is just like the, the only ending to that scene in a Blackadder universe, isn't it? Well, something, one, well, something I noticed, and, and this, this is again without talking about this too much, that you know that the bit obviously in, in Beer where Blackadder has to come up with an excuse for the guy vomiting in his fireplace. Um, that's obviously one of the series highlights, and it, you know it, it lingers. It, it never lingers for quite as long as I remembered it lingering on Ron Atkinson's face. But it's, you know, it's a good sort of ten seconds, isn't it, while he comes up with his, his thing. But I'd only noticed on this rewatch that both Tim McInerney and Tony Robinson get their own versions of that. And Tony Robinson's is when Blackadder comes in and asks where Percy is, and he's in the box. And, and Tony Robinson has that sort of ten seconds where he's trying to remember what the thing to say was, and then he says completely the wrong thing. Yeah, and, and the slow zoom. Yeah, but but um, Percy, Tim to, to McInerney, gets his own version of that when when it's um, when the Queen tells him to, you can shut up or you can have your head cut off. Oh, yeah. And he does it exactly, the camera does exactly the same thing of the slow, slow, slight zoom on his face where he, he's wrestling with the... And it gets a huge laugh as well. Like, the audience loved that one. It got, like, a huge, huge laugh. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know what they... I don't know if they shot... I presume they shot... You know, you know, obviously they shot one of them first and I guess they just you know they realised that worked well but they kind of gave the other actors their chance to do that version of it you know yeah yeah. It's, I mean you know rounding out I, I think I think, we're, we're, I think we've got to talk about Miranda Richardson now really because you know I think some critic that was reading talk about the series was pointing out the thing that I don't think I thought at the time when I was watching it but the opposite the sort of trio of Blackadder Percy and Baldrick you've, you've got this kind of this other family that he visits which is the is the queen Melchit and Nursey, who are kind of, you know, Melchit is her sycophant in the same way that Percy's is a sort of unquestioning sidekick, uh, and Nursey's kind of a Baldrick, you know, and uh, it's kind of, it, it's this little parallel, you know. Um, well, the last time I watched uh, Bells was, you know, I re- just realised there were so many funny women in, especially in that episode, you know, like, they're just, but they're also, I, I listened to a podcast with Ashling, is it Ashling Bay? Ashling Bay, The Irish yeah. comedian, B, yeah, and uh, she, uh, said that you know she loved uh, Father Ted because the female comedians in it were not afraid of being stupid and being grotesque and like you mm. know the men are and and that's what I was thinking you know after hearing her say that it, great examples are you know is the episode bells you know because there's so many really funny and you know women in incredibly grotesque makeup just being just as stupid as the as the as the male actors and stuff and so you know it's just uh, yeah it, it works really well and uh, just the shame there's not more of it. Is it is it Patsy Byrne who plays Nursey, right? Is that right? Um, it is, yeah. Is it Patsy Byrne? There, there was another thing in me watching actors today and concentrating on one actor was uh, the scene in Head when um, Blackhead has got the head tucked in the back of his tights and he runs into Queenie and Nursey. And the bit, I, I, I watched that whole scene and obviously Brian Acton and uh, Miranda Richardson have, I think, all of the dialogue. But Nursey is following uh, Queen around for the entire scene and just gazing... Like I don't even know what the expression is. Like just kind of like ecstatic to be there, yeah. kind of you know. But like just completely passive, and you know, obviously she ends the scene by doing that little kick. And sort of like she gets the like she gets the punchline. She gets to to basically yeah. end the scene yeah. with the punchline. Yeah, but it's just what a, what a strange character. So, uh, I I mean I I think 
I mean, John, John, what's your what's your take on Miranda Richardson in this? I mean, because she's just a joy, isn't she? Really, I mean, yeah, it's it's just beautiful. It's it's just a a perfect comic performance. It's uh, she's interpreted exactly what that character needed, and and it's probably probably one of the most difficult parts to play in that whole series because it's the one actual historical figure that we all have some knowledge of it's the one that really exists that we really have some you know cultural history with we all know that uh, elizabeth was the virgin queen we all know that you know she she died unmarried and and she died without children we all know that she was you know uh, her <laughs> Her parents had issues. Uh, we all know where she's come from. So for, for them to then play that for laughs actually really took something special to kind of go, OK, how do we do this? Oh, OK. Well, we all know she's actually a, a strong, powerful, important woman. Um, so we don't have to worry that we'll be taking that away from her. But what if she was like a squeaky voiced, capricious child who threw tantrums all the time because yeah. frankly that's what we think about kings and queens anyway isn't it so so they just played up to that mm. R- rather than reverse it completely and like change the character and say she was nothing like the history says it's more like the the events of her life are identical but the effect on her character is completely you know, different than than, than yeah. what we know. She's and not, I think there's she's a ty- she's a tyrant, but not in the same way. <laughs> yeah, and I think there's. I mean, there's. A, I was about to say there's two. There's more than more than two interesting moments where they play with kind of our historical knowledge. I think, and one of them's in beer, which obviously is the. I may have the body of a weak and feeble woman. You know, the famous speech that she gave at Tilbury Docks. But it's for entirely different reasons, and it's you know, and it's the heart and stomach of an elephant, and and they can concrete play that. elephant, yeah, yeah, concrete elephant, and they can play that for laughs. The other one I think is what it, it was really interesting is being the last one when they're away. How quickly Baldrick and Percy actually replace them, and Percy and Baldrick actually become part of the court, and she basically seems fine with it she has she makes a joke about having forgotten them but she kind of has it's that fickle that's what her court is like these guys are all her her favorites right now but it genuinely could be anyone and the fact that she adopts percy and baldrick and is so happy with that and and transitions into not really caring who's in a court again i think is a genius bit of a uh, bit of playing with with the real history and you know her relationship with Essex and and her her favourites being executed and rebelling against her. It's those lovely moments, and again, it all yeah. comes down to Miranda Richardson playing this pitch perfect, squeaky voiced child, basically, who a we adore and we're laughing with. We're not really laughing at. We're laughing with her, um, but can still carry the air of yeah. But I am the fucking queen, so you do kind of have to do what I say. <laughs> yeah, Percy, who's queen? Yeah, <laughs> that's a great moment. What what is what is her history like before Blackadder? Was she a quote unquote straight actress, or was she a comedian who then went on to do serious roles? Uh, you know, or straighter roles after Blackadder. You know, do you know was she just I was done she a, a bit of research on this? Yeah, I don't know. Like, was she a stand up or like you know what was she? No, John. I, I I remember I was when we were talking about doing this podcast. I was saying that I remember one of her straight acting roles. I remember the most is the terrifying villain she plays in the Crying Game, uh, where she basically plays like an IRA kind of cell commander, basically. Uh, which is oh my god, I've never seen the Crying Game. That sounds that's that's made me want to watch it even more. Yeah, she's actually really well. I see, I remember it's been ages for me, honestly. But I remember it being terrifying in that. But that, obviously, that was years after I'd seen her in this. Remember in Sleepy Hollow? Oh yeah, I do. Yeah, I do remember way too much of Sleepy Hollow actually. Yeah. Yeah, was, and then fine. also, yeah. <laughs> also a little bit later, you have her in Spider. You have her in that really terrifying psychological drama with Ray Fiennes in it, where where she's the just horrific mother, and it's it, it's it, you know it's terrifying to grow up with Miranda Richardson. Um, that is kind of all I knew her for. I think for years and years and years. Um, and she is obviously an extremely versatile and talented actress. So the first time you see her doing something that is 
terrifyingly away from Queenie. It's it's a it's a real jolt. It's a real shock. It's actually funny, it's funny we mentioned both the third and fourth series before. Um, in her cameos or like guest appearances in the third and fourth series, it's kind of the same thing in a way, isn't it? I don't. It's quite obvious. I've never really thought about it before. In both those episodes, she plays like people who seem to be sweet, childlike, naive child women and actually are formidably dangerous or at least capable intelligent modern women quote unquote you know it, it's 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 kind of like something it's obviously like a duality she like playing with um but just before we move on from Randa Richardson I was, I was just going to say you know when you talk about Emma as being this capricious you know tyrant and playing it to the hilt and all that sort of stuff what it reminded me of on this rewatch was not only it's kind of like a cross between obviously it's like you know sort of a boarding school girl cross with Caligula you know that kind of that kind of vibe but what it actually reminded me of is that iconic twilight zone episode it's a good life you know where where the whole thing is that it's the boy who can wish people away into the cornfield oh you know, it's yeah the, the overpowered child they, they did that again for the uh, twilight zone movie which i watched recently oh you said uh, yeah, yeah. and it was uh that was joe dante's section and it was by far the best section of that uh, very troubled film. Well, it's such a creepy idea, isn't it? And that idea of child, or child, actual child monarchs or like childlike monarchs who can can exercise that kind of power is is creepy and weird. And because I think the you know the bit in um, this is this is on Stephen Fry as well, and actually it's one of Stephen Fry's best moments. And this is you know the bit. I think it's the episode where they keep pranking Black Adder. It's money where he keeps coming to the court and being more and more annoyed when they just take away more and more of his money. But you know the bit where. Yeah. You know the bit where Queen then turns on a dime and she says, and now I'm going to have you executed. And Melchit realises that he's yeah. for the chop. And they play it really, really serious. It's really, it's kind of like the way Stephen Fry does it, where he's suddenly, he's literally terrified that he's going to die. And he's like pleading for his life and crying and stuff. And, and then obviously she, <laughs> she, she she laughs again and he realises that he has to laugh. But that was the bit that most reminded me of the Twilight Zone episode because he, he has to laugh at that joke and not let anyone see that he's not truly laughing at that joke because... She Praise the Lord killed. for the gift of laughter. <laughs> <laughs> he's angry, and the camera Furious. just lingers on it enough to show that he's like you know seething and barely holding it together. But it's really like it's quite a lot. Of that. And that's definitely one of the bits where Stephen Fry really gets to shine. You know? Yeah. No, it's it's wonderful. And uh, when I, uh, it kind of reminds me of when I take uh, Luca to Mum's house. You know, he can do no wrong. <laughs> <laughs> So you think having a three-year-old is kind of uh, is an education in that kind of tyranny? Yeah, three-year-old when they go to granny or nanny's house, certainly they can do no wrong. <laughs> yeah, a, a very quick a very quick Google of uh, Miranda Richardson has, has. I'll give you the highlights. You, you're absolutely right. She was uh, a, a trained actor, and she did. She made her name through stage, basically. She made her name through 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 theatre fundamentally but what's really interesting right. uh, i will caveat right. this by saying i'm on wikipedia so obviously you know do you due diligence everyone um but apparently <laughs> she made her film debut in 1985 as ruth ellis the last woman to be hanged in the united kingdom in the biographical drama dance with a stranger around the same time richardson played queenie in the british tv comedy black adder too so in 1985 people <laughs> who didn't already know her as a theatre actor were suddenly coming across Miranda Richardson and one of them was in, I don't know what Dance of a Stranger's like, but it doesn't sound like a comedy, does it? The last yeah. British woman to be hanged and yeah. the, uh, the other role, she's she's playing Queenie. So I think that's there right from the off and I think it's interesting that, that there are people of a certain generation who are like, well... She, she she must have been a comedian, right? She must have been a character comedian, that, you know, along with Stephen Fry and everyone else. And that's that's not who she was at all. Yeah, they must have just known that they had uh, she had the chops for it. They must yeah. have known that you know if anyone can pull this off and make it believable, then she can. The other really fun fact is uh, following that film, Dance with a Stranger. It says Richardson turned down numerous parts in which her character was unstable or disreputable, including. The Glenn Close role in Fatal Attraction. Oh no way! Wow! Oh wow! That would have been awesome. Oh, that's 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 an interesting parallel universe, isn't it? it would, no, it would only be awesome if she played that part as Queenie. Let's let's be honest. That's the film we want <laughs> yeah. to see. I want to see in the, the dress cut. As well. Yeah, yeah. I want to see the cut of Fatal Attraction where the Glenn Close role is played not by Miranda Richardson, played by Queenie. Oh, I want to see that rabbit boiling scene. <laughs> <laughs> with with Michael Douglas 
<laughs> with Queen because it's that then you can play it. it it's exactly the same as all of her other practical jokes it's really dark yeah. it's you know it has real really high stakes but somehow is is absurd I meant to mention the one, one last bit of Miranda Richardson performance choices, just because it's a it's a fun fact as well. Is is the bit where um the I think it's in Head where the messengers uh you know go or is it like Lord Pharaoh's cousin or something is pleading for his life successfully and then celebrating. He says, "May flights of angels sing thee to thy rest." And she does. I won't even try and do it, but she does the high pitch. Yes, yes. I'm sure they will. And it's just the most extraordinary sound. <laughs> I'm sure they yeah, will. Yeah. Just so confident. But but that's the thing I was going to mention was um that. May flights of angels sing thee to their rest. Line from Hamlet, right? Is um, that comes up twice in Blackadder? Once in the first series over the body of Richard the Third, and once then. And those are both b- like before Shakespeare would have written. They're both historical periods before Shakespeare would have written the line. You know, <laughs> they did go there and back and forth, didn't they? They did a Shakespeare joke with uh, was it Colin, not Colin Farrell, Colin Firth. Was it like in that way Colin first played Shakespeare? Oh, During Blackadder bumps into him and yeah. he invents a, he, he, he steals his ballpoint pen. And the joke in the future is, oh, Mr. Shakespeare, yeah, that's, he's the man who invented the ballpoint pen. You know, and they go back into the, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, it's not so good. <laughs> <laughs> good summary. No, we don't need to talk about back and forth, do we? Nah, no, no, no. One, never happened. One of the interesting things I found, actually, is, is, is one of the, the fan sites goes as far as to say that when when the show aired, the publicity material for Blackadder 2 for the season indicated that the episodes took place, this is really specific, in 1560, 1561, 1562, 1564, 1565 and 1566. So they have, the BBC <laughs> had very, very specific dates in mind. So actually, yes, those those do all predate Hamlet. Well done, David. I wonder if one of those was like, you know, one of Walter Raleigh's visits. Or yeah. Like, but I suspect, it. I think he was actually a bit later in general, wasn't he? As a sort of, you know, active political concern. But I, I don't know. It's. Um... Uh, I'm uh, very proud of them that they were surprised about nitpickers even back then. You know, they thought like people are going to sort of like write in and complain about, you know, this, uh, you know, so Walter Raleigh didn't sail in that year. He sailed in a different year, you know, like that kind of thing. But well, the, the, I guess you can never be too careful. The worst one for that is back out of three, because I think I think this has been well documented. But is it like I think the most egregious example is, is it Dr. Johnson and the Duke of Wellington were not, you know, they're not really contemporaries. You know, I mean, like it's, it's not really it's not quite, you know, it's not it's not like a million, million years away from each other. But they didn't really. You know, I think I think if, if he was alive at all, the Duke of Wellington would have been a very young man when Doctor Johnson died. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing. You know, it, it's set, that really is a collage of everything everyone half remembers from Georgian history. You know, uh, it, it, yeah, like a sort of summation. I mean, don't even get me started on Indiana Jones's chronology. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will. <laughs> for, 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 okay, let's do it. Part two <laughs> for another episode. Yeah. Um, I mean, we 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 haven't mentioned the the theme music by Howard Goodall. You know, which evolves the Blackadder theme from the original which was a sort of grand sweeping orchestral piece and um, you know it's, 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 I, lo- I love both the opening and closing versions of the Blackadder theme in this and I was listening to them a bit more you know because obviously you've got a, a proper musical talent and ear Matt but you know I was listening to them a bit more closely this time and it was weird actually particularly the closing scene the theme has that kind of um, I don't know if it actually is this but it sounds like a sort of Casio keyboard like preset you know what it was like, like, like almost like metronomic kind of like Yes. Beats behind it. Yes. Um, I know what you mean. It's, it's really strange. And I, I always kind of thought of it as kind of like a recorder or a flute. And then afterwards going to like an electric guitar as well. So like the, you know, it, it, it's really... Oh, oh wait, I, I'm thinking of the intro, aren't I? Actually, sorry. The outro is... Yeah. It's, it's, it's like the troubadour, is. you know, lute playing. Oh, yeah, I'm just trying to think of the actual instrumentation of it, you know, like when he's playing... But uh, oh my gosh, yeah, because you know, the, the 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 voice, the vocals are so upfront, it's kind of difficult to uh, actually even hear the uh, hear the tune. Yeah. But yeah, I think that one's isn't it more like a string quartet or something? Uh, that one instead of like anything. Come in and I guess loot stuff and a sort of period of yeah. stuff. But yeah, it, what's wonderful about the opening uh, is it, it is how um, it it sounds vaguely period appropriate, and then that mad electric guitar comes in. 
and yeah, it fits it's really just... well. That's the weird thing is it doesn't sound yeah, it kind feels of out of place. Kind of appropriate, doesn't it? Feels it feels yeah. kind of right. And the Black Adder has the most wonderful music in every series. Actually, like it's absolutely the, the the third one is like the outro to the third series. <laughs> we keep bringing it back to the fucking third series. Uh, <laughs> we, we just picked the we picked the wrong show, man. But yeah, um, it, it's 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 brilliant. It's so brilliant, and yeah, and it's just the, the, the bizarre kind of arrangements of it in each series it's it's so unconventional and so strange like uh, i suppose the most yeah. traditional is probably the first and fourth isn't it because you have your sort of basic orchestral score in the first one then in the in the yeah. uh, the fourth one you have your sort of basic army sort of uh, army band set up but yeah second and third are bizarre it struck me that I'd really like to hear extended versions of them, actually, because, you know, we've, we've we talked about the, the outro to the third series, because right? I, I think I described it as being like something like an animal collective B-side or something, you know, because it's yeah. so like, you know, all the drumming and everything's so wild yeah. and all, all the weird vocals. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, when I was listening to the opening theme of this, uh, this time I was like, I'd, I'd love to hear like a sort of two, three minute version of this where they kind of, you know, inter, you know extend it a little bit more. Yeah, the, the naked, the Blackadder naked sessions. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've... I've always said as well, and if it, you know, if we do Black Adder three, maybe we can play a game of: is this the bass solo from the Black Adder three outro, or is it the bass solo from Paul Simon's Call Me Al? Because yeah. <laughs> they are could identical. You, could you identify them blind? Yeah, probably not. Hear a bit of that, yeah. Well, that's a, that's a challenge for you. I've ever heard one, Matt? I knew I'd heard it somewhere. <laughs> Let's uh, no. Let's um. Let's take a break there, and uh, then we'll we'll move on to chatting about the um the specific episodes and you know some of our other favourite moments, and, and we'll talk a little bit about the sort of series structure as well because I think it's um it's you know there's still there's some unusual features to it. It's not quite as odd as the first series, but th- there are some things to mention. So uh, see you after the break. It's me, Flash. Flash by name. Flash by nature. <laughs> Hooray! Where have you been? Where haven't I been? What? <laughs> well, I'm here now. <laughs> Who is that? I don't know, but he's in your place. Not for long. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, bridesmaid. Like the beard. <laughs> Gives me something to hang on to. <laughs> so my old mate Eddie's getting hitched, eh? What's the matter? Can't stand the pace of the uh, in crowd. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Queenie. You look sexy. <laughs> but listen, wear your hair long. I prefer it that way. I've got such a crush on him. <laughs> and Melchie! <laughs> Still worshipping God? Oh, my Lord. <laughs> Last thing I heard, he started worshipping me! <laughs> Welcome back. Uh, so we're going to do a little bit of a trawl through the episodes of Blackadder 2. Um, I think these aired in January and February uh, 1986. Um, so I guess, yeah, I think we made references. So most of it will have been filmed in... All, all of it will have been filmed in 1985, including the one bit of location filming, which takes place in this, uh, in this first episode, Bells. And um, John, because you, you looked into this a bit, didn't you? And I think I think you've helped explain something that I always kind of felt about this as a, a series beginning, but, but but there's a production reason for it. Would you like to explain a little bit why this is kind of not the first episode? Yeah, again, this is just from me kind of Googling and listening to various podcasts. And I didn't know this until recently, and it was actually on this rewatch of, uh, of Bells and knowing that I was going to talk about it and knowing that we were going to discuss kind of how they transition from the first Blackadder to the second Blackadder and how they had different character dynamics etc. So I was watching Bells and thinking oh well that's a really interesting opening because your your opening doesn't have any of your main characters in it. It's, it's Kate and her dad. That's how the entire series opens and I'm like well, that's an interesting move because, you know, the first Blackadder didn't do that great with with viewing figures. So the audience need to give it a go as well. It's not just the BBC having to have faith in it. You need to win your audience back. And I thought, that's a really interesting way of doing it. But I wonder, I wonder if that was the first episode they wrote because that seems a really strange way to attack it. And sure enough, when I looked into it, the first to be filmed 
um, was was the next one. The first to be filmed was uh, Head, the one that the one that comes next. That was the first one they they filmed, and that was intended to be the series opener. And then when you know that and you watch Head, that's when you get the scene that the open with Blackadder trying to teach Baldrick maths. Um, Great, perfect introduction. This is how stupid Baldrick's going to be. This is how clever and witty Blackadder's going to be. Oh, look, here comes Percy. Here's what he's going to be like. You go instantly to the court. It's like the first ten minutes of Head is just like a perfect textbook sitcom opening. So I, I've i just been partly left scratching my head going, well, what, what was the reason? Why did they then switch that when it came to broadcasting it? Because the, there doesn't seem to be any massive difference in performance. I wouldn't say one episode is particularly funnier than the other. I think they both stand up really well. The, the, the only theory I can really come up with is that the BBC probably shared the anxiety about whether they were going to win audiences back with it. Uh, and my my theory is that they went with Bells because it's got Rick Mail at the end of it. It's got yeah, this absolute yeah. barnstorming cameo where Rick Mail, who's you know a, a biggish name, who's not going to be in the rest of the series. You know they've they've got you know Fry and Laurie and Miranda Richardson and 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 all of that, but they've only got Rick Mail once, and he comes right at the end of the episode. And what you want to get people tuning in next week is you want to go out on a massive laugh uh and that is my theory that they looked at it in the edit and they went you know what we need to make sure we win the audience back and that they come back for episode two and after that i think we've got them so i i think they switched them around and they went with the one that has the flashy (laughs) no pun intended (laughs) yeah the flashy cameo at the end of it that's thus goes my my thesis I think that's a solid theory. I mean, yeah. actually, it's, just, it's good that John's zoomed in on the, the Rick Mail ca- cameo already, uh, Matt, because um, do, you, do you want to talk a bit about, because we, we've obviously watched this since we were kids and it's a, it's a great bit and he's he's fantastic in it, but do you want to talk a little bit about the uh, the stuff we realised when we, I think we were talking about the young ones, weren't we, years ago, and we kind of realised about the, uh, the sort of breaking the fourth wall stuff uh, in it. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's just like you know, when you, when you have the Rick Mail cameo that comes at the end, he plays Lord Flashheart, who's been invited, and he turns up late to Blackadder's wedding. He was meant to be his best man, and yeah, it's it's the, the, there is actually something like four or five, including actually probably about six or seven fourth wall breaks by Flashheart. Does about four where he turns to the camera and says his lines. Uh, Miranda Richardson has one. Uh, which is crazy. So it's yeah. It, we were just Got saying such a crush on him. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. So it's like the young ones kind of is infected. You know, has come in and just taken over uh, the Blackadder universe for a moment. You know, and kind of come in there and and because the young ones was full of, of of you know obviously cutaways and fourth wall breaks. I've just thought how much uh, Family Guy owes to the young ones. Actually, come to think of it, but uh, that's that's something I never thought about. Uh, but yeah, uh, so yeah, Rick Mail uh, comes, he storms and breaks the set and brings his own show with him, which is just fucking brilliant. Yeah, the bit where he sort of um, throws Tim McInerney through the through the set doors is, is, the is unbelievable. Just the way the set buckles but beneath him and everything. Well, the way great. the set buckles, like, you know, basically says that, you know, the set wasn't ready for that. You know, maybe through maybe it wasn't even that. Maybe that wasn't scripted. You know, <laughs> like he just did it, and then like yeah, and the vicious headbutt that he gives him when he goes back through it, and it's so slapstick and so dangerous, and yeah, and again, so young ones. It's uh, it's absolutely superb. He steals steals the show, and you know, as you were saying before, John, what a, what a brave thing to do. You know, at the beginning of your show, you know, to have. It, one of the most memorable characters is not the lead. You know, he's not going to come back. I mean, people didn't would have assumed after that that maybe he would have been in it. You know, a few more episodes, but he wasn't. Uh, what an amazing and brave choice. It's funny, you know, in a in an episode because I was I was trying to think about ways in which Black Adder Two might have uh, aged less well and or you know be borderline problematic in twenty twenty one. And you know, some of it's obvious stuff like you know, I suppose like mildly racist language, especially against you know other European countries uh, in, in some of the episodes. You know, yeah. but one of the obvious ones is that in Bells, there's quite a lot of um, I guess you might say like gay panic humor in a way, isn't there? You know, both from Blackadder himself when he thinks Bob's a, a boy, and and you know from Percy when you know in the, in the scene where he kisses Baldrick and things like that. But I was thinking one of the things that really redeems it is you know arguably anyway is, is um, 
you know, Flash Art's line when he's like, weird, I always felt more comfy in a dress. And then you just seamlessly yeah. is in a dress in the next scene, you know, just in it. The coolest guy in the episode is, is, is like, yeah, it's a, it's a cross-dresser. It's a casual like transvestite, yeah, and loves it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's played quite well, though, I, in terms of it. You know, I wondered if, if I was going to find it prob- problematic in any way, but it's made quite clear that Blackadder doesn't really have a problem with it. The, the, you know, the joke that he makes about when he's messing around with Bob and he says, oh, you know, we'll, we'll make a joke about back ticklers like us men. Yeah, you realise yeah. he's playing a kind of machismo role and actually the the person who really has a problem with it all is the doctor yeah yeah and obviously we we hate the doctor anyway because he's clearly a quack and and he kind of represents that establishment of the time so actually i think if anything it's it shows a more interesting interesting view on that mm. Well, it's, it's quite great, you know, quite, it, it, you know, ahead of its time for, you know, to say, ashamed of yourself. He says, not really, no. <laughs> it's exactly that. It's, it, I, think it's, cool. I nice. think it's that line. I think it's that line that, that redeems it, actually. I think it's that, that line that kind of, however many years yeah. later, 40 years later, gets them out of jail. Yeah. He's clearly confused, but he's, you know, he's, he's at least more grounded than the homophobic doctor. Yeah. I, um, I, I think... Um, it's one thing that you get by putting bells up front at the start is you get the scene where Blackadder goes to visit the wise woman, including the the young crone outside. That's one of the best scenes. Just, in, I mean, I know that's one of your favorite bits, Matt. In history, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is this Putney? Yeah, lo- line line for line. Yes, line for line. It's it's just five minutes of absolute gold. It's well, absolutely could, you, glorious. You could probably get an awful lot of uh, Rowan Atkinson's characterization of as Blackadder in this series out of just yes, it is, not that it be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and the show's um, approach to kind of history in general, I suppose. Yeah. Just a wild stab in the dark, which is what you'll get if you don't start being more helpful. It's fucking genius. And you and you realise as as well. Again, it's it, rewatching it. It's quite interesting because when when like you you feel like these lines are part of you and you could probably write them all down anyway. Uh, actually hearing the audience reactions and going, oh my God, that is the first time these people had heard yeah. someone make that joke. And it really yeah. lands because it's really funny. But somehow, uh, uh, and how fresh and new that comedy must have been at the time. Mm. Um, whereas now, I guess you watch it back and you kind of go, oh, but that reminds me of lots of other things. But it reminds you of lots of other things because of Black Adder doing it first. Yeah, because... Yeah, because other people play it like that and they, they do sitcoms like that. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, there's there's an, there's another one, actually, that gets a really big laugh that surprises me every time. And it it's in beer when um, he he wants to send the invites out in blood. And he says to Baldrick, oh, you know, I'm going to take a bit of your finger and, you know, I'm going to write it in your blood. And, and, and he says, oh, just a little prick should do. And Baldrick says, I haven't got one there. <laughs> and, uh, like... We've probably certainly in the last couple of years we've all made many more little prick jokes than than frankly we ever, <laughs> ever thought thought we'd make in our lifetime. But it gets an enormous laugh. It's like that is the first time you people have heard the injection being cut little prick joke, and it's it's you know really interesting to see actually. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I, I think. Um, you, oh, and you get Gabriel Glaster, don't you? Who, who shows up later in the fourth series as well. You know, the fourth series in some ways is a sort of greatest hits compilation. You know, because you get I, actually one thing I like about the fourth series is that you you bring back someone who is clearly another Bob. You know, with the same gimmick, and 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 Blackadder in the fourth series just completely through, sees through it straight away, and it's not mm. really and it's not noticeably attracted to her or anything like that. They, so they sort of skip all that, you know, and just kind of. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, it's it's Bob, but we're not we're not messing you around with all that again. You know, that's just kind of this is what that is. Um, and obviously, you know, I mean, John, you obviously, you're, you're, I think you're our Shakespeare consultant, aren't you, in terms of picking up on references? But I think, I think even I knew that that was a Shakespearean trope when I saw Blackadder two as a, as a kid, you know. Yeah, and it and it's interesting because if you want to identify it, the the short answer is take your pick. Mm. You know, woman woman dresses as man, man falls in love, thinking it's with a man, and it's actually with a, like take your pick, Twelfth Night. Um, as you like it, cross-dressing a plenty. Yeah, it's funny actually. Going, moving on to head, um, it was one of your your mates at the pub, John, wasn't it? Who pointed out to me for the first time in life that um, head is at least you know the plot of head uh, with with the switching up and confusion of executions that may have happened at different times to different people is is a, at least partially a nod to measure for measure. 
which is, is yeah, yeah not i mean not even partially it's a huge nod to measure for measure where you know they they execute someone and they later have to pretend that they're not dead by switching around heads basically yeah yeah, yeah and that that was that was my friend alex and and i'll be honest i had never i'd never seen that uh, i'd never seen that in it partly because i don't know measure for measure terribly well but also what's what's interesting this brings me on to one of the the other lovely points about it having having it kind of died baked into to who i am so early on also i remember things like you know percy's for god's sake let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories <laughs> i knew that line way before i had ever come across richard the second way before it, and it was like when you finally come across Richard II doing, for God's sake, let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings, you go, oh! <laughs> and there's so many little lines like that, that that actually, because I was coming across this before I was really coming across Shakespeare in, in any meaningful way. Yeah. And it retrofits it, absolutely retrofits it. It's like I think we've discussed many times before, including on this podcast, Matt, where we've talked about how, you know, you can see the shape of references even when you don't get them. You know, you, you know where they are yeah. from the tone, yeah. the tone of yeah. things. You know? Exactly. The tone, the change of tone that, that it seems incongruous somehow that it's there. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think your mind is really good at recognising when things don't quite fit and stuff yeah. like that. So, yeah. And also, I mean, some direct references, things like The Simpsons and stuff like that, you know, there'll be so many... You know, I knew Psycho before I saw Psycho, you know, partly because of The Simpsons and other things. But, you know, Blackadder's yeah. the same. Like, I think, yeah, a lot of my Shakespearean knowledge comes from <laughs> it comes from Blackadder too. Well, it's funny, and I was talking about the that it be uh, crone before, you know, like Percy's kind of that character writ large in the sense, isn't he? Because he's the one who's always trying to drag it back to a Shakespearean tone. And, or, or not a Shakespearean mm. tone, but, but a, a somber Elizabethan tone. And it, and it yeah. seems like, like it'll, it'll call Blackadder noble. <laughs> Blackadder won't let like it. That, yeah, <laughs> yeah Blackadder, Blackadder is not standing for it. Blackadder refuses to be in the age that he's meant to be in. He's just like, you know, I'm not, I'm not <laughs> having any truck with any of that, you know, which is sort of end, endlessly entertaining. There's, there's something I want, wanted to say about Bells, actually, before we move mm-hmm. on, because there's, again, in the rewatch, there's, there's one joke where, obviously... We were talking earlier about, you know, Shakespeare and anachronisms and, and, you know, things actually not happening in their correct time periods. It it can go massively the other way where where one of the techniques they use for a gag is hugely anachronistic. And actually a lot of people probably won't get it anymore. And it's the it's the other outside location scene. So it's the wooing scene when when Blackadder is walking with Bob in the in the grounds of the the country house. Um. And then you get all of the names of these songs um, scrolling across the bottom on a ticker tape. And and <laughs> for younger listeners, this is because in in the eighties, probably up until you know the late eighties, maybe even early nineties, there was a. It was largely because of a company called Telstar, and they would basically they would publish compilations of popular music. They were just Muzak greatest hits albums and they would advertise them on TV and they would just have these nondescript adverts where they just had little clips of the songs and the names scrolling by on the bottom and it would always end with, and many, many more. And that's how you would sell albums Mm. (laughs) in the 80s to a large extent. But that joke, obviously, that doesn't exist anymore. That, That is so anachronistic. And I'm actually racking my brains to think of any other example in Blackadder where they made such a specific contemporary cultural reference that it kind of no longer works. And I think it's the only time they do it. It's the only reference that I can identify in the whole of Blackadder mm. that is specifically 1980s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and everything else is is, uh, is has no no real time. I think they're minor elsewhere, if, 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 if they're at all. I mean, it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think Blackadder's dated well in most respects by being a historical sitcom. But you're right, though, that is a rare... A rare, in, in a sense, a flub. In the sense that it does drag you out of it, you know. I've just, I've just realised they do the same gag as well that I was just talking about as well. Because one of the, one of the song titles is "My Love Is a Prick" on a Tudor Rome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Along with, I mean, it ends. It ends with uh, hot sex madrigal in the middle of my tights. So they just. It, it doesn't matter yeah. if you don't get the reference. It's got the punchlines built in anyway. Yeah, yeah. It's just getting sillier and sillier. I remember uh, getting my uh, mum to read that to me because I couldn't read. You know, when I saw. That's how young I was. You know, when I watched Blackadder and, and her being embarrassed to read it to me. You know, did she? Just wonderful. Did she genuinely read out hot sex madrigal in the middle of my tights? She probably flubbed that one. I think I remember just saying it's it's rude, it's rude or something like that, you it's know. Rude. Sort of me not You'll quite understand, understand one day. But then it was made the scene so much more bizarre because I wouldn't have got the reference anyway to the to the record thing. So the fact this scene was there and he's got a bird on his arm that's attached to his arm, like that 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 whole scene was just I didn't get that at all. You know, I didn't understand. It's why a very it was sophisticated funny. joke, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's a and it never joke. it never landed me. It was a nice bookmark in the middle of the episode, but it never landed with me. I didn't. I didn't think. I didn't see the joke. But however, it was still fascinating. You know, in the way that you know when you're watching early Monty Python and you just to be in that world is 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 mm. you know is extraordinary. Right, Maury, let's try again, shall we? <clears throat> this is called adding. If I have two beans, and then I add two more beans, what do I have? Some beans. <laughs> yes. And no. Let's try again, shall we? I have two beans. Then I add two more beans. What does that make? A very small casserole. <laughs> Baldrick, the ape creatures of the Indus have mastered this. Now try again. One, two, three, four. So how many are there? Three. What? And that one. <laughs> three and that one. So if I add that one to the three, what will I have? Oh, some beans. <laughs> yes. Do you, Baldrick, the Renaissance was just something that happened to other people, wasn't it? <laughs> Edmund, Edmund, come quickly. The Queen wants to see you. What? I said, uh, Edmund, Edmund, come quickly. The Queen wants to see you. Finish. What are you wearing round your neck? Ah, uh, it's my new ruff. You look like a bird who's swallowed a plate. <laughs> it's the latest fashion, actually, and as a matter of fact, it makes me look rather sexy. To another plate-swallowing bird, perhaps? <laughs> if it was blind and hadn't had it in months. <laughs> So anyway, moving on to Head, I, I was I was going to say that Head's one of the episodes I watched the most as a kid. I think because there was the sort of, um, I think I think you know I think it's something that can have the severed head effects and things like that, and you know the grisliness of, of the premise, but also have the frankness and sort of historical uh, wryness of lines like the religious genocide line, you know, which give you which sort of mm. hints at so much context without being heavy handed about it. It, it. it was just as I talked about on the first podcast, you know. I've, I've, child history nerd you know i loved all that stuff i uh, you know so I, I think head was one of the ones i watched the most and because it is a bit grisly you know and it's that it's kind of fun for that but also you know ron atkinson gets to do all the ridiculous voice changing stuff where he's wearing the bag on his head and all that kind of you know all that kind oh, of stuff and, i love it yeah and just you know as i say like the scene with the ploppies and you know it's it's just it's it's a it's a farce as well isn't it you know we we i think it was a previous episode where we were talking i think it might have been iron sun number nine one john most recently where i was talking about you know 40 towers and the kipper and the corpse and you know the the long history of like body disposal in, in sitcoms and you know it's kind of uh, yeah it's, it's got some of that to it as well hasn't it you know but it's just a really good as you said you know as more what was intended in a sense as the pilot you know it, it does just do, do such a succinct introduction to the the new ensemble and kind of gives you their their measure doesn't it you know their yeah. their measure for measure if you will <laughs> i was i was I'd like to say I wasn't dangling that in front of you, just ho- hoping you'd take it, but that's uh, that's, that's just I'll, al- I'll always take a pun, David, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Without question. As, as a kid, I don't think I fully understood the conclusion, you know, when they're talking about how he had a limp and, you know, his, and his speech impediment. And I think so he comes in and he's like, sorry about the back, didn't have time to shave. I didn't quite yeah, understand just... what was going on. So like yeah. that as a sort of punchline to the episode. And then the fact that you're left with that, you know, and that's that, you know, you don't see how this resolves. Like that's, that's brilliant, yeah. uh, which I really love. Yeah. Like how the hell is he going to get out of this one? You know, sort of yeah. like, it's, it's I'm quite fond of episodes of sitcoms that, that do that, you know, where they end like mid mid action they sort of like metaphorically cut to black when when there's a seemingly inescapable situation yet the next episode the, the situation is restored i i, I kind of it's yeah, all yeah. it's almost cheating isn't it because it's like sitcoms restore the status quo but that's that's just kind of saying the status quo got restored somehow yeah <laughs> <You know? laughs> and for some I'm reason he's got the lord him. high executioner in the next episode you know, and and all that kind of stuff. yeah exactly 
Yeah, because it's because it's years like because it's a year later, as we now know. Thank you, John. But uh, you know, it, 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 he's, he's, Rowan Atkinson is literally holding his leg. He's holding his leg, pretending to be an amputee. That's amazing. <laughs> but then again, if they if they didn't screen them in the the order that they thought, then presumably that's not true. Then presumably, if they really did think about the dates, then this one is actually a year after. Bells. This is a prequel. Oh yeah. Yeah, this is the Temple of Doom, the Temple of Doom of the series. Yeah. <laughs> Next time you're watching it with someone, John, you can say, uh, did you know this episode's actually a prequel? <laughs> you can really, like, wow people. There's one, um, there's one, one head fact that I, I want to throw at you both. Good, good, uh, good, good category. In, <laughs> in the hope that you both haven't also Googled this and looked it up. Um, so Lady Farrow... Uh, Lady Farrow is an actress called Holly de Jong, um, and I thought, oh, I wonder, I wonder if she's done much afterwards. I don't really recognise her, but um, she's done one, I would say, quite significant thing on her CV as well as Lady Farrow in Blackadder Two. And I'm just wondering if either of you know what that is, or if I'm about to blow your tiny little mind. <laughs> I think the latter. Yeah, the latter. Please do tell. Okay, I'm. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna watch your little faces. I'm sorry you can't see this, listeners. Newt's mother in Aliens. <gasps> oh, who's no? Oh my god! Who's only in the special edition, right? Yes, yes. who's yeah. only in the special edition, but obviously filmed it as as part of it. Filmed a whole sequence of their their backstory yeah, yeah, apparently, yeah, yeah. from what I can gather. Oh um, my god! And, yeah. and then just comes up in that little clip. Think and and it's her. That's Lady Farrow. Is Newt's mother? That's amazing. She she's shouting like Mayday, Mayday, isn't she? When um, she bursts back into the into that's a, that was a really good jump scare actually as kids because I remember renting the uh, special edition of Aliens. You know when when they're waiting for the parents to get back and then she bursts into the door. That was really scary. And then you see the face hugger on on her mm. dad. Like uh, wow, no way. Well, I, John, I think you've won, you, I think you've uh, I think you've won Matt's heart forever there, John. <laughs> Yeah, you can oh, if you if you so choose. If you want to look up Anne Jordan, the the name of the character. I mean, obviously the the alien verse has already fleshed in all of this backstory, and there's various graphic novels that tell the whole story of Newt and, and her family. Yeah. Um, Newt's tale, specifically. Yes, specifically that that very first appearance is is in fact Holly De Jong, otherwise known. <laughs> For all time, as, as Lady Farrow. It'd be good if when wow. he gets the face hugger on it, if she did the same cry that she does as Lady Farrow. <laughs> <laughs> Let me do this for you. What wife would do more? Oh, that's that's <laughs> definitely that's definitely a bit uh, where I didn't get. They were talking about oral sex. That's that's that's. Yeah, no, I tell. I yeah, that took me years. It took me took me years for that penny to drop. <laughs> I love the way it, his voice breaks. He goes, oh, I see he. It goes off. Oh, like. <laughs> and that, well, must have been, his, that must have been like, something in rehearsals that just kind of came out, wasn't it? You know? <laughs> yeah, it was amazing. You're going to tell me his arms grown back next. The way she drops that line is just fantastic. That's a great, the audience go wild for that, don't they? Because as, as it dawns on them, what's now going to have to happen? It's like, and it sort of, you know, Percy's processing it at the same time. You know, that's the audience kind of go and wild. And you see, like, Tim, Tim McHenry runs back into the room and he's like, he doesn't quite know when to drop the line because it's, yeah. uh, you know, it's going to get such a reaction. That's another, that's another great pause. That's another great uh, deferred gratification moment. You know, they can't want, ah, what? You know, they he's going to go, ah, and they all scream. Yeah. Oh, it's brilliant. It's joyful. It is so joyful. Well, well you know, we'll move on because we've got a few more to cover, but... um. <laughs> Me laddie. Ah, 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 indeed. So, Rob, I wish to hire you and your ship. Can we shake on it? Ah, ah you have a woman's hand, my lord. <laughs> I wager these dainty pinkies never weighed anchor in a storm. Well, you're right there. <laughs> <laughs> Skin, me lord. I'll wager it ne'er felt the lash of the cat, been rubbed with salt and then flayed off by a pirate chief to make fine stockings for his best cabin boy. This is uncanny. I don't know how you do it, but you're right again. Why should I let a stupid cockle like you aboard me boat? 
Perhaps for the money in my purse. <laughs> you have a woman's purse. <laughs> I'll wager that purse has never been used as a rowing boat. I'll wager it's never had 16 shipwrecked mariners tossing in it. Yes. Now, right again, Ron, I must say, when it comes to tales of courage, I can say I'm going to have to keep my mouth shut. Oh, you have a woman's mouth. <laughs> I'll wager that mouth never had to chew through the side of a ship to escape the dreadful spindly killer fish. Yes, I must say, when I came to see you, I had no idea I was going to have to eat your ship as well as hire it. <laughs> and since you're clearly as mad as a mongoose, I'll bid you farewell. <laughs> Damn courtiers to the Queen, you're nothing but lapdogs to a slip of a girl. Better a lapdog to a slip of a girl than a git. <laughs> <laughs> so you do have some spunk in you. Don't worry, laddie. I'll come. The next episode is Potato, and this is talk about actors cropping up and things. It took me till early adulthood to realise that this is the same actor playing Sir Walter Raleigh who plays Arthur Dent in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy TV show, which I also grew up watching. So that was that was a real. That's just one of those things where you know it's literally because he has a beard. I just didn't I didn't recognise him, you know. Uh, and but now I can't unsee it, you know. But it's uh, it's kind of a great example, isn't it? Of, of I suppose he's kind of a, he's another Melchior figure in a sense. Is he another sycophant who's kind of not even really a threat to Blackadder, because that, that's the other thing about Blackadder as a protagonist in this. Like Edmund doesn't really, like, again, he doesn't really want anything. He doesn't. He, he, mm. he just wants to be left alone, really. You know. And yeah. then, so, so you know. It, I, but, but I love that. I love that he's so annoyed. It, this is another thing where the sort of um, characterization of Blackadder really starts to sing, isn't it? Because he doesn't um, try and go around the Cape of Good Hope or avoid going around the Cape of Good Hope because he's ordered to, or because no. he, it will bring him riches or anything like that. It's because so what Raleigh just annoys him too much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he said he couldn't do it. He, he said she gets caught up in a boast, you know. Which comes to think about is is, is kind of how um, the events of uh, beer happen as well, really, isn't it? It's just, you know, Melchit's inability to drink, it just amuses him so much that he can't help but boast his way into a predicament. It's partly the everyman character again, isn't it? Because although he sees himself as a victim and, and sees that he would thrive were it not for all the idiots... In actuality, we can see that most of these problems are of his own mm. making... So it's, you know, it's perfectly profound human condition, beautifully drawn character. He creates all these problems for himself, but then he, he sees it as the world being against him. Yeah. I love I love that you're rewatching this one today. I love that uh, his plan to, you know, succeed is to, to, to not go to the Cape of Good Hope and pretend he did. I, love, yeah. I just love the simplicity of that. You know, was, obviously it goes horribly wrong, but I just love that. That that's. It, I think even as a kid, that made me laugh. I was just like, "Wow, that that well, could work, right?" That, like that brings into question, doesn't it? All the you know, sort of like the historical like, explorers and stuff. Like, did they really like go where they said they went? And it's like, you yeah, know, who was checking? Who yeah, was yeah. checking? Yeah, who could check? Yeah, it's, that's that's uh, wonderful. It's absolutely brilliant. And I do what I really love as well. You know the way um, he. Edmund is looking out the window and he says like, oh, how extraordinary. He goes, what's extraordinary? Oh, actually, I was planning a trip to the Cape of Good Hope myself. So he's just, he's yeah. actually looking out the window when he says the line. <laughs> that was just brilliant. I love it. I mean, I love that, you know, John, you were talking about the fickleness of the Queen's court as well. I love the moment when um, the, the Queen decides that she thinks this is a good idea and a cool idea that Blackhead is going to do this. And she remembers how dishy is and, and melts it. Uh, and Nursey, all they, they all just shift sides. Yeah, you know, they literally. They, yeah, they literally travel. The whole court literally travels and stands behind yeah, Blackadder, yeah. and you see the look, the smug look on his face that says, "This is how it works. I'm just playing the game. I know <laughs> yeah. how this works." He's, he's better at this than Sir Walter Raleigh. Well, but by, and by the by the end of the episode, Sir Walter Raleigh's just reduced to a, a, a pole that she's throwing hoops over. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't mention uh, Tom Baker as well, because um, this is. I think joint first exposure to Tom Baker for me because uh, it was either this or it was him playing Puddle Glum in the Silver Chair, the uh, BBC Narnia adaptation, which is an extremely different role to this. Um, but uh, it was definitely before I'd seen any um, of his Doctor Who, you know, because because I wasn't really the right age for that, you know. But it was um, it's quite a. I mean, it's 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 great because in a way he's um, I mean he's doing exactly what he's doing, but he's just kind of you know obviously he's just sort of sitting there and he's you know you know giving that huge performance and I love the bit when um, he comes into the court and him and Nursey just fall utterly in love instantly, like you know yeah. 
and I, I was saying to you as well, David, isn't it, isn't it strange? So actually, that scene when they're all sat around in the boat, I mean, how much does that owe to Jaws? Because, you know, Jaws... So the scene where they're all showing their scars and singing, you know, farewell and yeah. goodbye, you <laughs> fair God. Spanish ladies. That makes you realise how old Jaws is, isn't it? Or Jaws is like 10 years yeah. prior to this. Yeah, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, I mean... 70, 76, 77. So, you know, it's it's enough in the in the cultural mind then for you to kind of think it can't be a coincidence that you've written, you know, these these well, actually four of them sat around a table and one of them, you know, doesn't have any legs and, and <laughs> has has this has this thing. He he basically does the quint, but uh, but he plays mm. it for laughs. I never I never thought of that. I never put them two together. I bet I bet you've never had your both your legs chewed off, and he goes through the whole list, and it's basically you know Quint showing off um, about about all of his scars. I think one good thing about this episode is it also contains another one of the best Rowan Atkinson uh, kind of reactions, which is it, after it cuts that title card that says the day after the day after tomorrow, and then it, and then you just you know you, mid conversation you just say so you don't know the way to France. Either. Either. <laughs> no. <laughs> I must confess that too. Bugger. Bugger, yeah. <laughs> That's just the most underlined bugger that you've ever, that you've ever heard in the script. You know, it's incredible. Oh, um, my God. I'm just looking through IMDb, and I nearly... My, my heart skipped a beat when I saw that Mr. Barry Crane played Mr. Pants for one episode <laughs> 1986. <laughs> just the fact to come up with Mr. Pants. It's just like the best character name ever. Mm. A good IMDb. Well, you know, money's the next one, uh, actually. So, yeah. so, you know, uh, that was a good segue then. Oh, gosh. This place stinks like a pair of armored trousers after the Hundred Years' War. <laughs> well, Rick, have you been eating dung again? <laughs> My Lord, success! What? After literally an hour's ceaseless searching, I have succeeded in creating gold, pure gold. Are you sure? Yes, my lord. It's green. <laughs> That's right, my lord. Yes, Percy, I don't want to be pedantic or anything, but the colour of gold is gold. That's why it's called gold. What you have discovered, if it has a name, is some green. <laughs> oh, Edmund. Can it be true that I hold here in my mortal hand a nugget of purest green. <laughs> Indeed you do, Percy, except, of course, it's not really a nugget, is it? It's more of a splat. <laughs> well, yes, a splat today, but tomorrow, who knows or dares to dream? So we three alone in all the world can create the finest green at will. <laughs> Just so. I'm not sure about counting in Baldwick, actually. Of course, you know what your great discovery means, don't you, Percy? Perhaps, my lord. That you, Percy, Lord Percy, are an utter burk. <laughs> I, I mean, I know that's long been a favourite of yours, Matt, because uh, partly just because of the, the way is Ronald Lacey is called the actor who plays the Bishop of Bath and Wells, just just all of that, <laughs> just all of that performance. Oh, it's, it's such a precursor to Fat Bastard, you know, when you think about it, eating babies, <laughs> the whole thing, yeah. I mean, yeah, Mike Myers uh, owes a lot to uh, to Richard Curtis, that's for sure. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's really grotesque, isn't it? And, you know, you've got that kind of, like, outside threat coming in and, and you know, taking on Blackadder, but he's also kind of... He's, he's a hilarious character, isn't he, because he is so monstrous and so grotesque, but he's also kind of funny and witty in his own way and stuff like that you know like you know yeah so like you enjoy your work don't you things like that you know <laughs> bits of it yeah, so, you know. <laughs> 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 the violent bits yeah yes. i also it's it's great as well that this is similar to the shakespeare thing where it's just rewired your brain before you're aware of the the cultural references uh but uh, david knows this i read quite a bit of history over over lockdown i was reading quite a lot of yeah. medieval history so the bishop of bath and wells crops yeah. up and it is, it's just not psychologically, spiritually, emotionally possible to not put the word the baby yeah, yeah, in <laughs> before you, if you ever come across the name, the Bishop of Bath and Wells, you, you cannot stop yourself in your head from going, the baby eating mm. Bishop of Bath and Wells. You don't have any children, do you, Blackadder? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, no, he's great. I mean, there's also some lines in this, you know, um, the way they blackmail him at the end um, with kind of incriminating portraits. I think just like lines like, you know, well, we have the original sketches. You know, I, I found that funny as a kid without fully yeah. getting what it was talking about in terms of sort of modern blackmail plots and stuff. But it's, it's, it seemed, I think it has a lot of those like lines of blackmail where it seems clever and you know that as a kid, you know. Yeah, yeah, you, you pick up on it, but without knowing the specifics. I've just remembered uh, Leonardo Acropolis as well. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I was about to, I was about so, to say Are that. you any good? Let me present to you, Mr. Leonardo <laughs> yeah, yeah, Acropolis. Yeah. Are you any good? No, <laughs> I am a genius. <laughs> right, you better be or you're dead. <laughs> that one line is great. I mean, that that has that has the Shakespeare scene as well, doesn't it? You know, in the graveyard where that sort of uh, that sort of fool is uh, talking about. Yeah, no, it has. Yeah. It has poor Tom. It has. Yeah, it has. So that actually has the the Richard the Second quote in it. For God's sake, let us sit, sit upon the ground. Um, but also, it's got uh, poor Tom, poor Tom, I'm poor Tom, which obviously is is. Uh, Edgar from mm. from King Lear, but that's actually the minstrel mm-hmm. at the end. And I like the way, like you said, David, is he's trying to literally shake him off, isn't he? He's trying to push. <laughs> he's like a pest. He's like, get off me! It's like he's like trying to deliver his lines, and he's like, ah, get off, like, yeah. fuck off. <laughs> like that. And then at the end, he just pushes him into the mud, doesn't he? Like yeah. so, like you said, David, before, like he's trying to sort of yeah. deny the time that they're in, you know, again, and just kind of like just, just, just dispense with all that. Yeah. Do you? Matt, do you have a similar problem? Because obviously you've got strong opinions about the the timeline of the Indiana Jones films. <laughs> oh yes. Do, does this does this get even more confused because Ronald Lacey is also earned tossed in Raiders of the Lost Ark? Uh, oh, is he? oh my wow. God! No, yeah. I did not know that. <laughs> it's, am you I going to blow your mind, mind a second twice. time? That is <laughs> the baby eating Bishop of Bartha Wells is chief. Melty faced Nazi in Raiders no, of the Lost No, no, he's not. <laughs> You're kidding me. That's that's Ernst Tot. That oh. is. And he also played Newt's grandfather is... uh, in, uh, <laughs> in the even more. <laughs> he played Newt. <laughs> yeah, he played Newt in the original cut of it. <laughs> 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 they mostly come at night. Mostly. Mostly. That is okay, Fraulein. We are not thirsty. <laughs> I am the baby eating Bishop of Bath and Wells. Holy shit. No, I, I, I just never put two and two And together. I think it's one of those. I think it's I think it's Raiders as well. I think it, because Raiders is, is, ooh, what year is Raiders? Uh, eight, Hang on. Two. Raiders comes before eight, Blackadder 2? Yeah, before uh, either Blackadder, I think. Yeah, so so Raiders is before. It's one of, one of these jobs. There's definitely a story about Ronald Lacey where he was he was just going to pack it all in. He wasn't getting the work, and and you know he was going to go off and get a day job, uh, and, and and you know one one of these jobs kind of came along at, at exactly the right time. Um, one of these career <laughs> defining roles for. <laughs> Ronald Lacey. Uh, so I mean, it's the caliber of guest stars. Is you know, you talk about the third series before John, and you know how that might be your favorite. I mean, one of the things the third series carries on is that caliber of guest star, isn't it? You know that we've we've obviously touched on some of them, but that yeah, uh, that, has, that has so many highlights as well. Um, I, I should say before we move on from this episode, you know, uh, one of one of the highlights for Percy as well is is the whole green thing. You know, oh alchemy. Yeah, it's just. It, I mean, it's even before you know the sort of punchline of what he's actually produced. It's just the way he's attacking alchemy as a discipline. Uh, as, as a solution to Blackadder's things. And is it Blackadder's line about, you know, you're, you're going to attempt something that's eluded the greatest minds in the Western world in an afternoon? And it's like, yes, I love a challenge. You know, I love kind a of... challenge. Oh, that's amazing. I found, it very quickly, slightly off topic, I found a really interesting fact the other day about Isaac Newton. So Isaac Newton, as well as being an absolute mathematical genius who obviously came up with much of our understanding of physics and how the world actually works was really really into alchemy he was trying really hard to create gold from base metal um and i think it's i think it's john maynard Keynes, the economist spent a load of money to to buy a bunch of of sir isaac newton's papers at auction and he got them home and they were like but these are all these are all your your calculations for trying to turn base metal into gold. This is you're mad. You were you were also a complete madman. It's one of those strange things, isn't it? Like with uh, Arthur Conan Doyle being, you know, the creator of like the arch rationalist of fiction, but also being into seances and stuff like that. You know, it's it's just these strange things that you know the the human interest is large enough to encompass. You know, um, let us discuss. 
that's your inheritance. Ah, yes, good. Um, a little drink first? Drink, wicked child! <laughs> drink is urine from the last leper in hell! Oh, no! <laughs> no, this is only water. This is a house of simple purity. Oh, yes, I do. Then can you explain what he meant by great booze up? <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> My friend is a missionary, and on his last visit abroad, brought back with him the chief of a famous tribe. His name is Great Boo. He's been suffering from sleeping sickness, and he's obviously just woken, because as you heard, Great Boo's up. <laughs> well done, Edmund. And I think I'd better just go and visit him. First, over to you. You know, moving on to beer, um, because that's one that we watched an awful lot as kids, wasn't it, Matt? You know, that, that was really oh, like, yeah. one of our kind of favourite episodes in general, and I think it's part, partly because of, you know, Miriam Margulies showing up. Um, I read, actually, one of the things I read up uh, this time was, um, you know, the, the the guy who plays her her husband in that, you know, Lord, Lord Whiteadder or whatever he's called, you know, he, he that was meant to be Jim Broadbent again. Yeah. That, that was meant to be a reunion. They yeah. couldn't get him for whatever reason, that, that series, but that was meant to be another kind of, you know, kind of probably quietly seen stealing role for Jim Broadbent, you know. Oh, that would have been great. But uh, yeah, I think we like that episode so much because it was it was an excuse to slap each other and say "wicked child." Yeah, that's, that's probably true. I was thinking actually that this one, this one's one of the ones where it's so obviously a sitcom template. It's almost like a it's it's like um, it's like a parody. It's it, it's like almost crossing over from just being a sitcom into like a parody of a sitcom, isn't it? You know, the kind mm. of two groups coming over for dinner that you have to keep apart. Uh, you know, having to impress and having to have a party at the same time. It's just kind of, I don't know if, you know, it seems like the sort of thing that would have been done on I Love Lucy or, you know, The Honeymooners or Dick Van Dyke, doesn't it? You know, if it wasn't, you know, but it, it seems like it seems as old as the hills. And watching it this time, that almost took me out of it a little bit because I was kind of like, this is so... You know, I, I, I'm not saying it's like a bad episode. It's really funny. You know, there's loads of great performances in it. You know, it's it's farcical. It's enjoyable. But like, it's kind of, it, it's one of those ones where you can almost see them looking around for like, what other stuff could we do? Here, you know, and it feels. It almost it feels like maybe that. maybe they feel like they were being so on the nose, but that, that it was almost like a post postmodern thing. You know, what we're going to say like you know because they they explain the setup so well as well. It's like right, we're going to be in here, and then you're going to be in there, and that's sort of thing. So maybe they thought they were being clever, you know, in the way that they were going to do a traditional sitcom setup, but they were going to tell the audience exactly what was going to happen, sort of thing. You know, in a way, do you know what I mean? Like yeah. uh, I, I, who knows? Or maybe they just thought <laughs> we're running out of ideas. Let's do this. <laughs> yeah, this is correct me if I'm wrong. This is, I think, the episode where Baldrick says, "Because we are not at home to Mister Cop." <laughs> That's Cop. right. Yeah, he's been yeah. briefed. <laughs> Cor- correct. I, uh, I mean, this, this I've referenced it before, but this has the great booze up moment where you know the, the the guy runs in and loudly vomits in the fireplace and yells, "Great booze up, Edmund!" And then <laughs> Lady Wyatt is just, you know, do you know what that man meant? You know, can you explain? Yeah. Can you explain what he meant by "great booze up"? And that's the zoom in, isn't it? To Ron Atkinson, where he sketches out enough. Of, what I love about that is, if you really think about it, he sketches out enough of the story to begin telling the story, but has not <laughs> got there yet. So it's kind yeah, of like he starts. Yeah. He starts the moment he has to. He can't delay any longer, but he's still having to lay down the train track like Gromit in the wrong trousers. Rapidly, yeah, yeah. You know, kind of... <laughs> he's suffering from sleeping sickness. Yeah, it's, it's like what... when he rounds the corners, he's like congratulating himself on getting there. You know. Yeah. And then Percy actually says out loud, "You know, well done, Edmund." <laughs> like, yeah, Edmund. I know. 
I know it's, well, it seems it seems almost like you know you could have said well done Rowan at that point and been like you know like yeah. it would have seemed you know in keeping you know but it's, it's, it's such a great moment. <laughs> you know, I love that episode and you know having like Evan Miranda Richardson kind of you know turn up at the end and sort of throw a cloak off and reveal herself and it's you know um, I mean also obviously there you've got Hugh Laurie of course as well you know uh, cropping up as one of the ridiculous drinking companions you know yeah, um, Cro- yeah. cropping up tw- cropping up twice yeah I mean pop quiz does do you you have various characters who reoccur obviously in various uh sequences and i just wanted to say as well that that mr ploppy uh turns up in series four as the uh double agent as the as who they think is the german oh, agent but he's actually not that of course yes exactly agent no smith no way and that's, I, that's mr ploppy i always pride myself in noticing these connections but you put me to shame tonight john you're really uh, connecting the, the all the dots for me thank you man thank you jesus but also, is is there anyone else who appears as two different characters in the same series? I think Hugh Laurie is the only example where he's fart as partridge in in beer, but he's then uh, he he's then the Prince Ludwig the Indestructible. Yes, thank you, thank you for the name. There, there you go. Um, in in the next episode, and um, is he the only character? that they do that with I think he is I but I'll, I'll leave be. that for our listeners uh, you know please do email in this get great podcast at gmail.com if you uh, if you do know that um, forgive me Herr Black Adam I have been neglecting my duties as a host please accept my apologies <laughs> I accept nothing from a man who imprisons his guests in a commode <laughs> I hope this Come. Has not inconvenienced you. Huh. It takes more than a maniac trying to cut off my ghoulies to inconvenience me. Good. If he had inconvenienced you, I was going to offer you his tongue. <laughs> Believe me, sir, if he had inconvenienced me, you would not have a tongue with which to make such an offer. Let me assure you, Herr Blackadder, if I no longer had a tongue with which to make such an offer, you would no longer have a tongue with which to tell me that if I had inconvenienced you, I would no longer have a tongue with which to offer you his tongue. <laughs> yes, well, enough of this banter. <laughs> Who the hell are you, sausage breath? <laughs> you do not remember me then, Herr Blackadder? I don't believe I've had the pleasure. Oh, on the contrary. We have met many times. Also, you knew me by another name. Do you recall a mysterious black marketeer and smuggler called Otto, with whom you used to dine and plot and play the biscuit game at the old Pizzle in Dover. My <laughs> God! Yes! I was the waitress. <laughs> I don't believe it, you big Sally! <laughs> Will you have another piece of pie, my lord? <laughs> but I went to bed with you, didn't I? <laughs> For my country, I am willing to make any sacrifice. <laughs> but I'm not. I must have been paralytic. <laughs> Indeed you were, Mr. Floppy. Yes, all right. <laughs> now. You know, moving on to Chains, the, the finale of it, um, I think I think uh, this, uh, on rewatch, this is just really, really solid. Uh, and it's weird because, you know, like as we were commenting before, it sort of breaks up the... The nearest to the sort of stasis that we've had for the ensemble and stuff, you know, because you, you take Blackadder and um, uh, Melchit off, you know, to to, in, to the dungeon, you know, <laughs> while where they carry most of the episodes' main scenes, and I think, you know, the, the scene where. I suppose one of the just more obvious... I was talking before about the scene where Percy's going to hide in the box and stuff. One of the more obvious sort of bits of shtick in Blackadder 2 is the bit where the torturer is having to explain what he's going to do to Blackadder. <laughs> isn't it you know where they end up playing charades i mean that's that's i think that's enduringly funny uh but it's and it's you know obviously it's the way ron atkinson is mixing his kind of complete contempt and disregard with a kind of polite helpfulness in kind of teasing all the stuff out of him and it's it's just it's just incredible that scene isn't it? Yeah. oh it's a sign <laughs> why does prince ludwig have a spanish torturer because he's german isn't he yeah, there's a sort of slightly muddled thing in there about the Spanish Inquisition, and you know, oh, okay. 
which seems just sort of thrown in to be another period detail, really. But you know, it's kind of, and then obviously you get Hugh Laurie coming in as Prince Ludwig the Indestructible, who's kind of a, I suppose he's sort of a riff on Blofeld in a way, really, isn't he? He's kind of like you know that kind of probably Blofeld in particular, but that kind of master of or Moriarty, you know, that kind of master of disguise, arch villain, <laughs> um, which is please is accept great. my apologies. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's he's also kind of the the Colditz villain isn't he he's kind of he, he's also you know in the in the vein of ludicrously villainous nazis um <laughs> bringing us back to roland lacy mm-hmm. um so he he has that element it's almost the same character isn't it but it's aid edmondson in mm. in four is yeah. it in, it's it's in four isn't it and the it's aid edmondson yeah yeah, kind of, kind of doing doing the same thing. Yeah, and I'd actually misremembered it, and I thought, oh, Hugh Laurie's actually only a very small part in uh, in Beer, and then because it's Aid Edmondson who is the the weird Jim, and I was like, no, it's it's not the series too bad. He is is uh, is Hugh Laurie, and you do get that lovely moment where you where you actually get Brian and Laurie kind of riffing off each other very very briefly on mm. set. It's uh, and it and it's really nice. It's nice to see when you have the backstory of, of you know, how well these guys know each other and, and work together in different contexts. To see that play out in, in Blackadder is always always exciting. Yeah, it's nice to see the double acts uh, put back together again. But what I um, loved about this one is that the he is in so much immediate danger, but he never has any fear for some reason which you know he plays everything like he's just completely comfortable and fine and I think that that always made me laugh because I just thought you know the, the box that he's in from a start should be incredibly painful but the fact that he's you know at no point even when he's turning the key yeah. <laughs> like sort of making the device work he's like oh for god's sake how can you question me you know <laughs> like, yeah. that like that he's on holiday funny. at a bad restaurant you know exactly kind of, yeah that whole thing it was just it's the genius. nonchalance of it isn't it yeah it's, it's part yeah. of his charm we, you know we haven't really got time to talk about this but the the attractiveness of this kind of black hair. i think i was talking to you matt in the first episode that we were talking about how about all the fan fiction from people who you know have a thing for rowan atkinson and, and black Adder, but you know this is this is the sexiest manifestation of Blackadder as well. You know, which part of that's the costume, obviously, and the sort of, you know, the beard mm. and everything. But this is, it's the charm, isn't it? You know, at root, it's the, it's the, and the confidence, um, yeah. as well as, you know, the intelligence and a bunch of other attractive attributes, even though he's meant to be kind of a weaselly coward. It's almost like, it's almost like Ron Eckerson is just kind of quietly done with that, isn't it? It's like, he's not, he's going to, you know, he's, he's a coward in theory, this Blackadder, yeah. but actually, he's not going to play it like that, you know, really. It's, yeah, the ridiculousness of the situation is going to overtake any fear that he has about anything like that, you know. Just, yeah, it's, a, it's he's sort of selective in his in his fear. Yeah, and it makes him a very flexible, well, you know, a believable and consistent but, but useful character to point out various ridiculousnesses as well, isn't it? Because he can always mm. pivot back to that point of, I'm... I'm kind of on my pedestal here, just laughing at all this, you know, uh, or, or you know, being, being, as you say, like mildly irritated by it, you know, but never more than that. <laughs> Takes more than a lunatic trying to cut off my ghoulies to inconvenience me. <laughs> That's one of the greatest <laughs> lines ever. Yeah, again, it's all it's yeah. all in the delivery, isn't it? It's all in the delivery. You know, it's all Rowan Atkinson. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I, I remember the. Um, it's funny we talked about the ending of the first series of Black Adam. I, I had this sort of like theory that you know they they basically all end well not theory but this observation that they all end in death really and all end, you know like black and forth most famously but this this even has that sort of slightly tacked on weird ending where during the credits apparently prince ludwig has somehow taken over and killed the entire cast and yeah. he poses as, as miranda so miranda richardson gets to you know close out the series with hugh laurie overdubbed over and i found i remember finding that very eerie as a kid this would be before i'd seen the first series but because it's got that spooky kind of is it like a bell tolling and like wind howling over it and it's kind of yeah just, just the uncanniness of Miranda Rich and being overdubbed and things like that I kind of it's meant to be a laugh line but it's it's sinister enough you know you've got like the, the cast with like blood flecked mouths and things like that you know and it's just kind yeah, of yeah there's all dead on the floor and everything yeah that's true it was just the abruptness I think more than that was just the abruptness of it it was just like you know okay <laughs> you know even as a kid I was like that, that that's how they're that's how they're seeing it out then, are they, you know? They're, yeah. Well, they're, they're really pushing it as well, aren't they? They're, they're kind of going, okay, we're asking you to believe we've got a character who really is Elizabeth I. We know we're making a comedy here, but we're going to have Sir Walter Raleigh. We're going to refer to things that were actually contemporary and happening at the time. And our very last gag 
is going to be to say that Elizabeth I actually had been taken over and impersonated by a mad villainous German, <laughs> yeah. and therefore the royal family are descendants of that mad villainous German, and they're like, that's... That's the go. final joke we're going with, and we know it's absurd. You've already bought into the absurdity of us setting everything in in this historical period. Mm. But we're gonna we're gonna do one last gag that's gonna make you go, oh, <laughs> yeah. But it, that's, it's that's also both like absurd, the, you know... but also quite satirical and a little bit dark. Mm. But it's also like, oh, you know, Ludwig was brilliant all along as well. You know, as much as they were making fun of him and everything, he was a master of disguise. You know, yeah. that's, that's, well, that's kind of a, a nice twist, double twist. Well, and yeah, it's, yeah, and it's yet another secret sort of hidden history, you know. And, and also, also actually, the next member of the royal family you're going to meet in three years, played by Hugh Laurie. So it even, yeah. it even sort of tracks, you know, you <laughs> ge- ge- genetically, if you like, you know. It's kind Checks of, out. So it's very strange, you know, because it's, it's almost a weird dream ending in some ways. But, you know, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting twist to it. I also I also think I could spend probably all day long in in the same way that you would rewind the cat scene. I could spend all day long rewinding Hugh Laurie going, "Yes, my lord." <laughs> <laughs> it just there's just something inherently funny yeah. about because he's he's switching the character so quickly and so absurdly from this pompous yeah evil German to, yes, my lord. Such a disappointment yeah. for a girl. For a girl. And I, <laughs> yeah. Where are those naughty parchments? <laughs> yeah. No. And then what I'd like to do is in, intercut that with, you know, bits of him in house, just to, just to see how far we've gone. <laughs> oh, that'd be great, yeah. Well, you know, we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, but um, I, I really enjoyed this trawl through Blackadder 2, and um, thanks for joining me, both of you. Um, and, you know, I don't know if we'll... Um, I would encourage people to go back and listen to episode 15 where we talk about the first series and um, hope this has been, you know, I was going to say of some use. It's like I'm providing a public utility or something. You know, this is, <laughs> hope this has been enjoyable for you guys as it has been for us. Um, and I don't know if we'll end up doing another Blackadder one. You know, might, might do. There's certainly a lot to treat and I think, you know, there's certainly a lot to go into in the, the two remaining series. Um, well, we've already covered all the best bits from Blackadder 3 in this episode. <laughs> yeah, so. That's true. No, we really have. Um, but, uh, you know, Matt, would you, like to, would you like to plug anything that you've been putting out there recently or about to put out uh yeah so uh, we're continuing with uh, matt and mike pull focus which is our um sort of movie lovers podcast that me and my friend mike do uh we interviewed joseph delaney most recently who uh, authored the spooks apprentice novels and uh which uh, became the movie seventh son uh we've got a few guests uh coming up to round off the year and uh, so yeah find us on uh, youtube instagram and uh facebook matt and mike pull focus Fantastic, and uh, hope to have you back on an episode soon uh, of this. And John, hope to welcome you back to the show soon as well to discuss some other topics. I hope so. And uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us. See you later. Peace. Bye. been listening to the escape goat podcast hosted by david pagiani if you want to contact the podcast with any feedback or thoughts you can leave comments on our lips in page or under our youtube videos or email us at escapegoatpod at gmail.com you can also reach the show on twitter on at egoat underscore pod and follow us for new episode notifications this podcast is available on youtube apple podcasts and spotify as well as our lips in site escapegoatpodcast.libsyn.com Original intro, outro, and any other incidental music for this podcast is composed, produced, and made available by permission of Richard Gilbert.